Okay, here we go. Okay. Let's see, we're recording. I'll call the planning board meeting for the Boulder Planning Board for October 22nd, 2020 to order. And the first order of business is to go over the rules of this virtual meeting. I'm going to turn it over to Jean Gatza, our moderator. Jean. Okay. Thanks, Harmon. Welcome, everybody. Um, all right. I uh, looks like I'm I'm sharing. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, we have a few rules in order to keep the meetings respectful and orderly. I'm going to go through these real quick. Um, any activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. And just as if we were meeting in person, the time for speaking or asking questions is limited. Either I or Harmon, the board chair, will recognize applicants or members of the public to speak and will unmute you. Um, please, we need anyone intending, intending to address the board to please use a full name. If your full name is not currently displayed, please change it or you can send it to me in the chat and I'm happy to change it for you. Um, no video will be allowed except, okay, come on, there you go. Video will be permitted except for board members, um, staff and applicants. We're asking that all others participate by voice only. Um, Harmon and Cindy and I will enforce the rules by muting anyone who violates the rules. So please don't do that. Um, please use the chat function only for technical issues to communicate with me or Cindy as the host. Um, this is not a place to be asking questions about the content or making comments about the, um, the matters at hand. And, um, and then only staff and board members will be allowed to share their screens. We have um, the public hearings tonight. So we'll have an open, open comment that is for anyone who would like to address the board for topics that are not scheduled for a public hearing. We'll do that in, um, before the other public hearing meetings. If you could please use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to speak, um, I will go through that and um, call on folks to indicate and then we'll, we'll um, tee you up to speak both during the open public, open per participation and during the public hearing um, once we get to those items. I will call on those that have raised hands and unmute them. And as I mentioned before, testimony will be by voice only. So don't turn your um, cameras on. If you are participating by telephone, you can press star nine to indicate that you'd like to speak during public participation or at the public hearing. And then when I call on you at star six to unmute yourself. Um, each speaker will have three minutes to address the board. And I'm gonna use a little yellow 30 second sign um, and have a timer going and you'll hear a little ding um, when, when that three minutes is up. So please let's be respectful of everyone's time and keep comment to three minutes. Um, and we're not really using the Q and A function. We should be able to do just fine with um, chat and raise hands. Um, to get all of these functions done. And um, we are not allowing pooling time for this meeting. So thanks to everyone who's here and who will um, provide public comment. With that, I think that's it. Harmon, anything else? Good for me. Does okay. Cindy have anything? I just wanted to let Jean know, I believe there are a few applicants in the attendees, but I didn't want to add them. So you can do your- I'll work on that as you guys get going. Great, well, welcome everyone. Um, and welcome to all the members of the planning board. We have a full body tonight. Um, the first order uh, on the agenda for us to vote on is approval of minutes. Um, we've all had an opportunity to review the September 17th and September 24th minutes. So uh, let's talk about the September 17th minutes first. Does anybody have any comments or would like to make a motion? I'll uh, move to approve them. John, get a second. Okay, I saw Lupita's hand, so we're gonna uh, have a motion to approve the September 17th minutes from Gerstel, seconded by Montoya. And uh, I'll do a roll call vote, David. Aye. And uh, Lisa. Aye. John. Aye. Peter. Aye. And couldn't hear her, but she said, aye, I could see it. She raised her hand. And Sarah? Aye. 
Okay, and I'll vote aye. So we've approved the September 17th minutes unanimously. Uh, any comment or a motion on the September 24th? I'll move to approve them. Okay. Oh, we have a motion from Gerstel. Can I get a second for John? Okay, Lupita again. Um, so we have a motion on the table to approve the September 24th, 2020 minutes by Gerstel, seconded by Montoya. I'll do a roll call vote. David? Aye. Lisa? Aye. John? Aye. Peter? Aye. Lita? She said aye. And Sarah? Aye. And I say aye. So that's a 7 nothing vote to approve the minutes for the 24th. Thanks for all the work on those, Cindy. And now we're moving to public participation, which is for any member of the public who wants to speak to any matter that is not a public hearing item tonight. The only public hearing we have is a concept plan review for 1820 15th Street, the Grace Commons Church and its annex at 1603 Walnut. If uh, that's what you're here for, then uh, there will be an opportunity for the public to speak after the presentation uh, of that matter. So uh, hold your horses on that. If you wanna talk to the planning board uh, about any other topic, now's your opportunity. I'm gonna turn it over to Jean. Um, Jean, if you wanna manage the, uh, the public speakers for our public participation section. Great, thank you, Harmon. It looks like we have three folks with hands raised. Um, so, um, Linda, let's confirm. Did you want to speak to the, um, for the general public participation or did you want to speak um, during the, um, the public hearing for Grace Commons Church? I'd like to speak for the Grace Common public hearing. Okay, I'm gonna put your hand down for just a moment. Um, and and we'll we'll raise it back up when we get to that public hearing. Thank you. Okay, we have Lynn Siegel and Peter Wells. So Lynn, you can go ahead. Oh nope, you can go ahead and um, unmute. I don't know if I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, there is a problem here. We do need the participants format because that shows everyone that's at the meeting. I don't come to these meetings to not know, not only do I not have a video, not only do I now not have a video window that's blacked out, now I don't have anything. And I don't know who's at the meeting except the board. This is just so not okay. It's eight months since this virus and y'all should know better Hire a web administrator if you need to get really advanced in engagement to your community. This is utterly ridiculous. Who's at this meeting? Am I the only one here besides you guys? No, there's a lot of staffers. There's a lot of other people that came. I wanna know who's here. That's why you use participants or use whatever you need that I can see a list of people here. You know. Why are people yelling? Why are people swearing? No, I'm not swearing. It's like at council this week. I'm not gonna swear. I'm gonna do worse than that. I'm gonna speak truth to power, okay? This stuff, this is not okay after month and month. No wonder that I yell. Why does your kid yell? Because they don't have any choice. They don't have any control whatsoever. You have domain over them. Well, this is not a kid. This is another human being that's to be respected in this community. Now, last night or the other day at council, Chuck Farrow came on and he said, well, the reason that they didn't hear about the cancellation of the meeting for 2-9 North on this very critical thing to them, which is the Macy's redevelopment, was that the person that was working the job job to, to get them the new date quit. So like, that's my fault, Chuck? No, it, you know, this is the blame game. Oh, the public's yelling at staff. Oh, council's defending staff. It's like the blame game. Who's, whose fault is it? You can't make mistakes like that in this community. It, it just can't happen. This is like you get jail for a period of time for that because that impacts the whole community. 
it's a big deal. You have to redo some things. It's costly to me. My taxpayer dollars that, that you're spending are wasted. If this person, if you have someone quit and they don't make a change that they need to, and that un causes an uninformed constituency, that's a problem. And you know, then after I speak, I don't hear anything. Poof, you know, it's like I never said anything at all. That's why people are angry. Not okay. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn, we have 17 attendees besides the staff and applicants that are here tonight. Um, so hopefully that helps. At least there's there should be a, um, probably a very Who? healthy. Who? Um, Who? Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Um, I see Peter Wells hand up. Peter, you can go ahead and unmute. Yeah. I wanted to speak at the at the tail end of the meeting along with um, Linda, my uh, neighbor, specifically about the um, annex. The portion. other public hearing. Okay, very good. Um, we'll call on you when when that time is has come. I don't see other pub, other hands for the open public participation. If anyone else would like to address the board um, on, on general comments or or other items that are not um, what's scheduled for the public hearing. Okay, I see Robin Wolf with a hand up. Robin, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, this was just a test because I couldn't see anybody else. I don't really understand how this works. So I'm gonna lower my hand. I just wanna make sure I'm on there. Great. Regarding the okay. annex. We'll, we'll get you for the next one, perfect. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I think we're ready to move on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jean, for handling that. Um, we're on the fourth item of a few more on our agenda. And this one is discussions, dispositions, planning board call-ups and continuations. We have three call-up items. They're all floodplain development permits. Um, I'm gonna go through them one by one. The first one, 4A, a call-up item, floodplain development permit, FLD 2020 0067. It's at 2850 Calmia Avenue, a partial interior remodel of the Boulders Apartment Clubhouse. The decision may be called out by Planning Board on or before 20, October 27th. Is there anyone who wants to discuss, ask questions, or call this matter up? Okay, seeing none, I'll move on to 4B, uh, floodplain development permit, FLD 2020, 0080, 4095 19th Street, a private residence high hazard zone fence plan. Uh, we have until the 27th to call this up. Any comments, questions, discussion, call-ups? Okay, not seeing any, I'll move on to C. Uh, the last call-up is floodplain development permit, FLD 2020-0081, uh, 1940 Walnut Street. It's a retaining wall replacement along Boulder and White Rock Irrigation Ditch. Also uh, expires on October 27th. For our call up. Is there anyone who wants to speak to this? John? Yeah, uh, I just had a question of staff on this one. For uh, attachment B, uh, that figure, uh, I, I find it difficult, if not impossible, to understand what, what we're supposed to learn from it. And I wondered if, if staff uh, could explain it to us. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Give me a second. It's the uh, the uh, natural flood hazard layer ferment, and uh, it has a whole series of labels all over it that uh, that are illegible. At least. Uh, um, that's part of the application process. That's information that's required to be submitted as part of the floodplain permit. It's coming from FEMA's website, so it's not the most uh, user friendly in that aspect. Uh, the better drawing or more informative would be the one on the next page, which does a better job of clearly showing the 100 year, 500 year high hazard zones and conveyance zone um, at the project location. Well, I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to figure out how you use this uh, information. And uh, presumably we're supposed to use it too, since it was submitted to as part of the application. How I use the, the what's provided as the ferment in particular? Is that what you're asking? Yes. 
I don't use that actual map that's supplied. I go to FEMA's website or use the city's actual uh, floodplain maps that provide all of that same information, but in a much more usable format. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't intend to call this up, but I, I don't I don't think this is, you know, this is useful or proper to include as part of a, an application. I would think that putting it in some form that that we can actually understand what is being presented to us would be much more appropriate. That's I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. All right. John, thanks for bringing that up. And I, I second the notion that we shouldn't have things in our uh, in our packets if if uh, they're not useful. And and um, to save space in our packets, Curtis, if uh, if you've got a link to a map that you actually do use, um, you might consider just linking um, that in the staff report rather than um, including a map that's hard to read or a table that's hard to understand. Uh, I don't want to just uh, leave you with that. If, if you have any response to that, you, you may respond. I will do that in the future. OK, fine. All right, John, so not calling it up. Can we move on then? OK, great. Let's go to the public hearing. Um, this is a, a long paragraph that I'll, I'll read into the record. Uh, so it's a concept plan review for redevelopment of the property located at 1820 15th Street, Grace Commons Church, formerly known as First Presbyterian Church, for an addition to the existing church campus, along with the redevelopment of the site referred to as the church annex, located at 1603 Walnut Street, proposed on the main church campus is demolition of an existing addition and construction of a new, build, of new building area for a total of approximately 104,873 square feet on the campus. Land uses include assembly and recreation space, along with meeting rooms with building height up to 49 feet. Proposed at the annex property at 1603 Walnut Street is a new four-story, 55-foot tall mixed-use building with ground floor non-residential uses, including church assembly space, a small cafe, and ground floor parking, along with 30 permanently affordable residential units on the second and third floors, and an event space and deck on the fourth floor. This is reviewed under case number LUR 2020-0033. Um, and before I turn it over to staff to, to take it away, uh, I want to go through uh, any kinds of disclosures or uh, necessary recusals for planning board members. Um, is there anybody who needs to make any disclosures or who wishes to recuse themselves from this hearing? I'll just disclose that I walked the site um, yesterday. Okay. Lisa? Um, I'll disclose that I've sung in the building and attended many meetings in it. <laughs> Any other disclosures, ex parte communications, John? Yes, I've, uh, I've walked and bicycled around the site numerous times. Yeah. David? And I have also um, visited the site and uh, uh, attended uh, BIF uh, screenings there but um, nothing that uh, would uh, influence my ability to be objective. Okay. All right, then I have to disclose that uh, the engineer on this project is JVA and the architect on this project is Coburn. And I have a project that I am currently working on and have been working on for a few years now in Gilpin County. And the applicant uh, and my client in that project hired Coburn and JVA. Um, I have no contractual relationship. Um, I do not share any information about this project with Coburn or JVA. I have no uh, financial interest in this project or anything related to anything that JVA or Coburn does. Um, so I'm just making that disclosure in the interests of full disclosure of relationships. Ella, did you want to say anything? I think you already mentioned that you don't have a contractual relationship yourself with those um, contractors for the applicant. Uh, but I also wanted to ask if you um, could be fair and impartial in reviewing this matter. Yes, I can. I can be fair and impartial in reviewing this matter. matter. And uh, also, um, I have to, I, I feel like I should disclose that one of the, the people who is going to speak, who's, who's a, an adjacent neighbor, 
Robin Wolf, um, did approach me and my law firm to represent her um, in, uh, in responding to this concept plan. And I did speak to her for a couple of minutes before I realized what the, the conversation was about. And then I provided her with referrals for another attorney or two that she could work with to uh, represent her in responding to this concept plan. Okay, so then I'm going to turn it over to Charles, Charles Farrow. Um, if you want to take it away here, Charles, and uh, begin the staff presentation, be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening, members of the board. Elaine McLaughlin is going to take you through staff's analysis this evening. I'd also point out that we have a um, number of staff members from um, our housing division as well as historic preservation to help uh, answer questions from the board after our presentation this evening. So take it away, Elaine. Great. Thank you, Charles. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to jump right in. There's a lot to cover on this one. Um, but just as a recap, as most of us know, um, concept plan review is for staff, members of the public, and the planning board to provide comments to the applicant. And there's no formal action of approval or denier, den denial on the application. And we look at broad concepts um, such as land use, transportation, and architecture. It's to inform the next step, which is site review. So first, it's important to note that the required public notice was given consistent with the code section 943. Staff and the board received a number of public comments and there's attendees who may wish to speak this evening who did send comments. As a brief overview, um, We'll start by taking a look at the historic context of the site. We're gonna review the surroundings and the site itself. And then um, we'll take a look at the built context and the planning context. And then we'll summarize some key issues that we identified in the staff memo. So the site includes the main campus of Grace Commons. It's formally referred to as uh, First Presbyterian Church and the church annex property that's up in the upper right-hand corner there at 16th and Walnut. The church has been um, on this campus and this site um, since 1872 when a small church was built. In 1895, the iconic red brick and sandstone chapel that we know of, um, we all know of, was constructed at the corner of 16th and Walnut. It was designed by a Denver architect named Frank, Franklin Eugene Kidder, who actually also designed the Chautauqua Auditorium. Then in the 1950s, a new wing of the church was built and a courtyard on the north side of the site. It was designed by um, Boulder architect Hobie Wagner. And then additions were also built in the 1970s and 1990s. So it spans um, well over 100 years and redevelopments occurred all through those um, 100 years. And then um, also noteworthy is in the 1980s, um, the church acquired the property at 1603 Walnut in the upper right-hand corner there. And um, it was intended as um, uh, to serve youth ministries and the deacon's closet, provide clothing and necessities to homeless persons, and then also provides Thanksgiving dinners to over 300 members of the homeless community. And that's been going on for decades in the annex building. So then, um, as with most of downtown Boulder, the surroundings are eclectic, and that's owes to the fact that there's been that decades of um, change um, that's occurred in the downtown. And so to the west and north, it's mostly large commercial buildings, of course, in the downtown. And then to the east and south, it's residential uses, um, both historic homes, like in the Chamberlain Historic District, you see in the lower right there, as well as newer contemporary condos at 1655 Walnut. So then being within the downtown, the site is one of three regional centers that's been identified in the comp plan for decades and generally um, considered as places with potential for infill and redevelopment and are higher density compared to um, established residential neighborhoods. And then the BVCP also identifies the importance of the central area noting that it'll continue as a regional service center of the Boulder Valley for everything from office to retail, financial, governmental, civic, cultural, and university activities. Then within a quarter mile to a half mile, the, essentially the walking distance to the site, there's around two dozen bus stops, 
downtown Boulder bus stations a couple blocks to the west of the site. It serves both local and regional buses. And then, um, as you can see on the right, there's a number of alt mode facilities, including 10 B cycle stations, um, eight car share facilities, and there's multiple pedestrian and bike connections, of course, being part of downtown. And then for vehicle parking within a quarter to a half mile radius, there's about 1,950 parking spaces in public parking structures, and then uh, 379 spaces within surface lots. lots. There's also a number of um, on-street parking spaces throughout downtown. Then the comp plan identifies the site as regional business, and that's defined as areas that'll remain a dominant focus of activity where street activation and a mix of uses is encouraged. There's a number of different um, uses that um, are part of the regional business, including shopping facilities, office, financial institutions, and then of course, um, cultural facilities as we have here along with um, housing that's compatible, it's anticipated to be compatible with the residential surroundings as well as business character. And um, it's also encouraged, housing's encouraged in a, a regional business. And um, consistent with that, it's DT5 zoning, it's defined in the code as business areas within the downtown core in the process of changing to higher intensity where there's a wide range of uses permitted. And this area has the greatest potential for new development and redevelopment in the downtown core. Then both sites are within the non-historic and interface areas guided by the downtown urban design guidelines. And uh, the objectives are to reinforce the downtown pedestrian character, encourage sensitive design abutting neighborhoods, and maintain building diversity and type and size that respects that residential character. And then as also shown, the 1895 church is within the Chamberlain Historic District, which is a local historic district that was designated in 1995. And that also includes areas east of the site. And that um, district has its own set of guidelines. The map on the right illustrates areas in crosshatch that are planned for demolition. And it should be noted that the changes within the Chamberlain uh, boundaries are pretty limited and they don't impact the historic chapel a concurrent landmark alteration certificate review has begun and James um, Hewitt is available to answer any questions that you may have about that process. So the project's uh, twofold on the main church campus, the applicant's proposing a new addition and on the annex site at 1603 Wal Walnut, the applicant's proposing a new building. Plans for the main campus include removing about 26,000 square feet of that 1950s addition and adding just under 44,000 square feet of new building area that totals about 105,000 square feet for the main church campus or roughly 1.17 FAR where a 2.7 FAR is allowed. Uh, planned uses include assembly space, recreation space, including a basketball court meeting rooms, um, it's 49 feet in height is proposed, essentially in filling that corner surface parking lot that you can see from the aerial on the bottom, um, very prominent corner in downtown. And the, the plan is to move that parking function mid block on 15th, provide 13 um, parking spaces on the site to help support the existing preschool use along with uh, about 60 bike parking spaces. So the applicant's also planning on opening up that currently fenced courtyard along Walnut that you can see in the bottom aerial image um, with a new north facing courtyard space and a roof deck above. And then the annex properties plan is roughly 38,000 square feet, four stories mixed use with ground floor, uh, storefront spaces that include ongoing beacons closet and the kitchen on the west side, along with a bakery and cafe on Walnut Street with tuck under parking accessed from the alley ground floor parking for 19 spaces. The two middle floors are planned with 30 permanently affordable residential units, uh, a mix of both um, efficiency living units and one bedrooms. And the top floor is planned as an event space with 3000 square feet of roof deck on the corner and the FAR on this building works out to be about 2.69 FAR, again, where 
is permitted through site review in DT5. Uh, the lower image illustrates the roof deck along with a resident amenity deck on the east side of the building separated by a stair tower um, to the main deck. And then uh, the upper image illustrates the west elevation. So the required next steps in the process include site review for height modifications as it stands today, 37% um, parking reduction for the annex site, a trip to design advisory board would be required, um, and then LAC review for the Chamberlain historic um, interface, a demo permit for the 50s edition, and then use review for the event space on the roof deck at 1603 Walnut. So for key issue one, there's a number of BVCP policies that the proposal on both sites is preliminarily consistent with as shown on the left column, as well as those for which the application requires some refinements for consistency shown on the right. And we'll just highlight a few of these this evening. Policy 1.10 acknowledges that the city is and will remain a major employment center with more jobs than housing. And so the provision of 30 units of permanently affordable housing with a mixed use building at 1603 Walnut in the downtown, close to where people work, access to transit meets this policy. Then uh, similarly for 2.16, the mixed use buildings planned with permanently affordable um, along with uh, uh, Deacon's Closet and Kitchen as we mentioned. Um, and so this mix of uses is consistent with that policy. Regarding uh, policies to support the housing needs, um, the provision of those 30 units um, of permanently affordable in <clears throat> a couple different sizes addresses these policies. And then um, these policies are essentially about ensuring character and livability of established residential neighborhoods and making sure it doesn't undermine um, or spillover impacts ensuring compatibility and regulating those impacts. And then in that regard with the proposed event space and deck, um, it could generate noise impacts. And so the applicant will be required through the use review application to host a good neighbor meeting and to discuss the management plan with the neighborhood. And then these design policies are about buildings that are approachable and pedestrian friendly. And we'll drill into that a little bit more using um, our analysis of the guidelines. And so we did look at preliminarily how um, both the church site and the annex are consistent with the guidelines. We'll start first with the church. Um, there's several that staff identified that should be considered in plan refinements, including 2.1e and g that are about how parking and service areas should be screened or parking should be structured to reduce uh, visual impact. Staff suggests integrating the refuse storage into the building. Um, and less having it uh, be an enclosure outside of the building. And that uh, while surface parking is discouraged, there may be some options to do architectural screening um, or plantings um, to screen from pedestrians along 15th. Uh, the church addition appears to meet this guideline or these guidelines for a similar building height, mass and scale at the corner um, where 49 feet's planned and where buildings of 48 feet and 50 feet are on the nearest corners. Staff did note some concerns about the church addition um, <clears throat> regarding monolithic scale and the need to avoid featureless facades. Uh, staff notes that the prominent corners without ground floor transparency are an entry, so there should be a better means to um, provide fenestration on this important corner at the pedestrian level. Then similarly, these guidelines recommend how to achieve transparency and ensure there's uniform intervals of transparency. The idea is to ensure that as you're walking through a space as a pedestrian, there's interest that's generated as part of the, the experience of downtown. Um, the North has uh, less transparency um, without that uh, traditional facade rhythm that's expected. Um, this illustrates there's not really um, a clear differentiation either with the upper floors from the lower floors that characterize downtown buildings and is expected. Um, so they not only should be transparent, but be taller to engage the, the pedestrian on that ground level. And then regarding the um, proposed uh, building at 1603 Walnut in the Annex with the guidelines, 
parking structured and tucked under the building so it meets this guideline. And then it's also evident that the two street sides are well designed and the guidelines for transparency are met um, along with building entrances. But additional information really does need to be provided about how it's um, going to appear in the alley and also what the massing is um, for both staff and neighbors to better understand. And then of course the building meets the 25 foot facade intervals and ground floor transparency with that non-residential storefront. So then as we noted guideline 2.2b uh, recommends that buildings appear similar in height, mass, and scale to other buildings. So with taller buildings at key intersections being acceptable, it states that if new structures are significantly taller than adjacent buildings, upper floors should be set back a minimum of 15 feet from the front to re reduce the perceived height. And in that regard, across 16th Street is that 55 foot tall century link building um, kind of a monolithic building in and of itself and adjacent to the east is the 55 foot condominiums at 1655 Walnut. And while that building is also um, 55 feet like this one, it, it does step back the third and fourth stories. Um, and we've heard some concerns from neighbors um, about the fact that this building doesn't appear to have that step back and that it could impact them. And then across Walnut Street is the Chamberlain Historic District. It's one and a half to two stories. And to the north of the site is 1600 Pearl. That's three stories and 49 feet. And in that regard, um, the building's consistent with the height of 1600 Pearl. And it does step to three stories toward Chamberlain and Walnut, although not to two stories. So that concludes staff's presentation. Are there any questions of staff? Okay, so I'm gonna open it up to planning board to ask some questions of staff. And um, I saw Sarah's hand go up first. Go ahead, Sarah. Elaine, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And um, I enjoyed reading the packet. Um, uh, I'm, maybe this is a question that will end up going to Kurt, but I'm curious uh, what uh, target audience there is for the permanently affordable housing, because I think that will play a role in our discussion about the parking issue. Sure. Um, it, we could ask that of Kurt or of the applicant. Um, Whichever you'd prefer, whoever you'd prefer to answer it, it's fine by me. Maybe the applicant should address that. That's yeah. probably a good idea. Okay. David? Oh, yes. Um, thanks, Elaine. Um, I. Uh, um, I know that um, we were originally were going to do a joint uh, meeting with the Landmarks Board to look at this. And uh, um, so I just thought um, it might help us all to kind of understand what that would, what the difference would have been if we had done a joint meeting. Uh, would we have had the Landmark Alteration Certificate in front of us as well and, um, and, and look at the overlaps there? Uh, or um, I, I was just curious about that. Uh, and as we, um took a look at some of the changes. It appeared as though it wasn't as substantial as we originally thought and would have necessitated having that joint um, hearing. And so in this case, um, it's going to be deferred to the Landmarks Board separately with their LAC process. And then there's a demo process. Um, and if you'd like James to talk about that, he, I believe he's on the line here. Yeah, th thanks for coming, James. Um, I actually, I um, you know, I, I know a number of us have served as liaisons to the Landmarks Board, so we're pretty familiar with that process. And as I was going through, it did seem like it would probably be a, not a lot of overlap with the concept plan. So, um, so I'm pretty comfortable. But James, if you had anything to add, that'd be great to hear. Uh, good evening. Yeah, uh, thanks. Well, I think Elaine covered it pretty well. Um, you know, the, this is an unusual property. I don't know if I can think of another example of a site review where we've had a historic district that sort of takes in a piece of a property. So um, we thought that it might be better to have a, or might be useful to have a joint meeting um, with the planning board, that is the landmarks board and the planning board 
to just sort of generally discuss the project um, because as well as being partially in the Chamberlain Historic District, it is adjacent to the downtown historic district on the north. So there, you know, there are context issues that aren't really within the purview of the landmarks board yet. Um, I think there is sometimes value in having that, you know, that sort of discussion. Um, so just to follow up on something else that Elaine mentioned is that the, um, the applicant has submitted a landmark alteration certificate application for the work that is to occur in the district. And um, I, think, I think you showed that on the map or on the site plan, Elaine, where that intersects. So it's again, kind of unusual because part of, part of the building is in there in the district and part of it's out. And then part of what's being uh, proposed for demolition is older than 50 years. So it will have to go through the demolition review process, which of course is different than the landmark alteration certificate review process. So what we're trying to do is just um, make these reviews concurrent and create, uh, uh, you know, some interaction between the, you know, on a staff level basis, but as well, so the boards understand what the others are doing. Great. Hey, thank you for that explanation. That that uh, clears, clears it up a lot for me. Appreciate it. Any other questions that are specific to staff? John? Yeah, uh, two questions. One is with respect to the, the housing that's being developed, uh, is that in uh, coordination with uh, Boulder Housing Partners or some other uh, agency, or would this be operated by, by the church itself? Um, that's a great question for the applicant, John. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't have that information as part of the concept plan packet. All right. And the other uh, question I had is concerns the same building, and it shows on the east top side a, a small uh, open space adjacent to the uh, the building to the east that's separated by by some building from the large event space mm -hmm. to the west and i was unclear about whether that small space is intended for a, a an event space also or is there some other use intended for that so my understanding is that it's intended for the residents. So it's an, a resident amenity deck. While they each have um, uh, a deck or a balcony within the building, each unit, this is more of like a um, community space, community gathering space for the residents only. Actually, thank you. Any other questions for staff or turn it over to the applicant. Going once, twice. Okay, so I'm going to give it back to um, Elaine to help the applicant with their presentation. And, and the applicant has 15 minutes to make their presentation and uh, may also take at the end of public comment uh, three minutes for rebuttal if they want to. Elaine, it's all yours. All right, um, I'm just gonna turn it over to the applicant team and I'll control uh, the slides. All right, Elaine, this is Doug Smith. Can you hear me all right? Yep. All right, uh, uh, good evening planning board members. My name is Doug Smith. I'm a member of Grace Commons Church where I serve as a leader of the Boulder Vision Project. Uh, this project was begun almost a decade ago when First Presbyterian Church began to seek clear title to its property in downtown Boulder. And the concept plan that you have before you tonight was adopted by our congregational leadership almost a year ago. We believe our downtown location that we've had for the last 147 years is a gift from God, and we want to be a gift to our city. We see countless opportunities to love Boulder in the intersections of culture, business, education, and spirituality that are core to our community. But we face a challenge. Our facilities have become outdated and continue uh, difficult to navigate. Our main campus buildings have become a barrier to the mission of our church. And the annex is an opportunity 
unrealized. Our vision is to radically transform our buildings and footprint as a gift to the city. We will design them with the needs of our neighbors front in mind. We will create common spaces to gather, learn, go to, go to the Boulder International Film Festival and create. We will literally open up walls and doorways so that we all know that they're not just welcome in our space, but this is a common space for them as well. At the heart of this vision is a commitment to declare that we are for the city of Boulder, not only through updates to our buildings, but through our lives as well, being open and willing to serve out God's great love for us. We want to transform our main campus and annex to create spaces for our church and our city to meet on common ground by creating prominent and welcoming entrances, indoor and outdoor meeting areas, and those that promote relational connections by improving education and discipleship spaces for children, students, and adults, including a gym and preschool for our church and community use, and by updating our worship spaces and creating an intimate prayer chapel uh, to accommodate small services. We want to embolden our partnership with the city through our new purpose-built Mercy Ministry facilities in the Annex so that they will serve those facing employment and housing challenges. We're grateful for the time and effort expended by city staff in reviewing our concept plan and for the thoughtful and helpful comments that have been made. We hope to provide greater clarity to our plan through tonight's presentation. And to that end, I will hand this over to Josh Felix, the BGW Architects, who, will, who are our partners for the design of the main campus. Josh will be followed by Pete Weber from Coburn Architects, who are leading the entitlement process and also the annex design. Also with us tonight is Catherine Bean from Element Properties, who are our development partner on the affordable housing. Josh, over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear, hear me okay? Great. My name is Josh Felix, BGW Architects. Can we go to the next slide, please, Elaine? And the next one. Elaine, I'll just trigger you with the next slide, please, as we go through here. Well, good evening again. The Grace Commons Church Project, which comprises a full city block between Walnut and Canyon and 15th and 16th Streets, provides much needed building space for a thriving church that seeks to better serve its community through its facilities. Through selective demolition, remodel, and the construction of new buildings, this proposed development will provide clear, inviting, and spacious access points for pedestrian and vehicular flow, enhanced open space, community-oriented facilities, and a revitalized downtown street frontage consistent with city planning goals. The existing campus, which totals roughly 88,000 square feet of building area, was built in several phases over the years and is anchored by the historic chapel. Next slide, please. Which sits on the corner of 16th and Walnut. This historic chapel is completely within the limits of the Chamberlain Historic District and is outside the scope of our proposed exterior renovation and development. Next slide, please. Our proposed development, as illustrated in the massing diagram, pulls back some of the incremental development to the west of the historic chapel to provide access street frontage with relocated parking and much needed community gathering space, which are not attainable in the current campus configuration. New building development will extend west to the corner of 15th and Walnut. Parking and the utility pedestrian entrance has been developed midway along 15th, creating a natural setback from the street. The placement of the new building along with the extension of the historic chapel provides a natural gathering space and encourages pedestrian circulation to the main entrance through a large landscape hardscape open space. Next slide, please. The proposed design includes the demolition of roughly 27,000 square feet of existing building and existing courtyard fencing and walls and is highlighted in orange. This demolition, although outside the limits of the Chamberlain Historical District, will extend through construction that dates back to the 1930s and is currently being reviewed by the Landmarks Board. In addition to the building demolition, we also propose to remove all the existing paved parking and two of the current site vehicular entrance points along Walnut. Next slide, please. The project will provide roughly 11,600 square feet of new building area over three floors with an additional 5,600 square feet of occupied roof area. The building construction access runs west, northwest, 
extending from the current Sheldon Jackson Hall to the intersection across from the post office building. The tallest three-story building form will occupy the northwest corner of the site, anchoring the downtown intersection with a missing fourth quadrant building mass. This corner portion of development will replace an existing at-grade parking lot, which is in line with city development standards. The building will be set back off the curb lines to maintain sightline triangle requirements, including required depth city sidewalks, while maximizing building frontage to the maximum extent possible. Next slide, please. The programming of the new building will provide a dual entry system, which opens up into a large pre-assembly gathering space and lobby. The entrance to the new building will be developed as an extension of the open space courtyard to the north. The interior gathering, gathering space and lobby will be surrounded by smaller format assembly spaces and cafe kitchen elements, which will open up into this internal campus hub. Moving northwest, the building form and programming is geared around a multifunction gymnasium. In order to maintain gameplay requirements, this space is at a floor below the grade plane. The gymnasium is a key piece of the Grace Commons Community Wellness Program and of this building design. It is the church's intent for this gym space to be a downtown Boulder community asset. Youth assembly rooms, which open up to the entrance courtyard via large roll-up glazed doors, round out the proposed first floor. The southwest corner of the existing building, currently used as a daycare, will receive an interior remodel and will maintain its daycare usage. The second floor consists of multifunction religious classrooms, a large balcony space, and administrative office areas. The third floor houses collegiate ministry space and opens onto an occupied roof deck, which will be used for ministry events and gatherings. Next slide, please. The layout of the buildings has provided a natural vehicular parking and pedestrian access courtyard off of 15th Street. This courtyard will provide 13 parking stalls on site, which will be adequately landscape screened. Since the site has no alley or serviceways, the courtyard provides this crucial utility access while providing much needed parking. Entry into the campus will be through the main entrance lobby and also via a new direct entry into the daycare at the southwest corner. Next slide, please. The North Courtyard and Gathering Space, which is being developed by Carol Adams of Studio Terra, will be a highlight of the overall site design, pairing hardscape pedestrian surfaces with landscape gathering elements and layering with natural seating. It will provide a natural outdoor assembly and through space. The building, open space, courtyards, and roof decks have been designed to enhance the design access created by this development and the annex building while highlighting views of the flat irons. Our open space elements will be used in our stormwater quality and overall site design, which will be designed by our civil engineer, Charlie Hager of JVA Consulting Engineers. Next slide, please. The exterior elevations provide building breaks and facades meant to coincide with internal building functions. The large glass curtain walls on the Walnut Street side open up into large assembly spaces, spaces, which in turn have large open ceiling plants to maximize natural light. Modules of brick highlight material transitions and necessary stair and egress elements. Next slide, please. The upper roof deck stretches through the building forms, linking the courtyard to the north with the west exposure on 15th. Next slide, please. The tallest of the roof elements maxes out at roughly 46 feet above grade plane and is a comp is a component of the gymnasium building form. This single sloped roof overhang with large exposed steel columns extending through curtain wall glazing provides an architectural focus at the intersection while not overpowering the rest of the campus. Based on city staff feedback, BGW is developing a concept which will extend the glazing down to near sidewalk level in this area, opening, opening up primary sight lines into the gymnasium. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The 15th Street Auto Pedestrian and Utility Courtyard will maintain the use of a large format glazing into open assembly areas and smaller inset windows into open office areas. Steel window canopies will be utilized to shield from southern exposure and a smaller scale version of the main entrance canopy is highlighted at the second lobby entrance. Next slide, please. The exterior materials on the project will be a combination of cement and wood rain screen, brick and metal panel. The brick will be carefully selected to harmonize with existing brick on the campus, specifically the historical chapel. Exposed painted steel elements will be used at canopy columns, railings, and sunshades. Next slide, please. The buildings proposed in this overall project due to proximity, use, and exposure have been designed to highlight each other. The design access created between them will be enhanced by material selection, lighting, and view lines, both at the street and roof gathering event levels. To explain the annex building programming and design, I'm handing the presentation over to Pete Weber of 
Coburn Architecture. Thanks, Josh. I'm Pete Weber. Um, I'm with Coburn Architecture, and uh, we are the architects for the annex portion of the project. Elaine, can you go forward, please? This is the building as it exists today. And really what we're tasked with doing here is to really improve and expand on the, the missions um, of the church. And I'm gonna walk you through kind of how we intend to do that. Um, the first one, next Elaine, um, we're gonna talk about the, the ground floor. The ground floor is, um, is an L-shaped building um, along Walnut and 16th Street with the parking in the middle, next. And then the uses that are in that, that L-shaped piece are the, um, are the various ministries that the church operates. Next. And it really starts in the basement. We are, we are proposing a basement that lives under that L-shaped portion. And that basement will house the deacon's closet, which is the, um, the portion of the ministries that the church provides uh, clothing to, to the homeless and less fortunate. And also in the basement is some storage for, uh, for the residential portion of the building. The residences above are relatively small and can benefit greatly for some additional storage. Next. The main floor is really the, the public portion of, of how the ministries will um, relate to the, to the street and to the public in general. It's anchored by a kitchen. That kitchen will provide vocational training uh, for those that are transitioning into the workforce and it serves as a hub for really two main functions. One is the lamb's lunch, which is um, lunches that the church provides to the less fortunate. And then a, a public um, cafe and bakery, which will live on the corner of the building, which will be open to the public um, and will again, access that same kitchen. Also on this floor plan, you can see the two, the two main entrances. To the north is the event entrance where folks will come to go to the fourth floor event space. And the, um, the residential entrance is on Walnut there, which also uh, acts, has access to the parking behind. Next. The second and third floor of the building are really about expanding what the church is providing to the community. And this will be um, 30 affordable units. Uh, right now, um, we're targeting uh, around 60% of the AMI for the workforce um, housing that this will provide. Next, please. The second and third floors are, are, are identical floor plate and they are a mix of uh, studio units and one bedroom units. Next. And then the fourth floor. The fourth floor um, is an event space and you can see in this slide how it is pulled back um, from the corner of 16th and Walnut. That does two things for us. It allows us to have um, a great roof deck, and it also puts the mass of, the, of that fourth floor away from the street. Next. So this, this event space, um, it really um, is focused on the main indoor event spaces, which you can see in yellow there. That is where um, most events will take place. That's about the same size as actually the roof deck, um, which is on the south and west corner. And then you can see the ancillary uses that are kind of um, around that space um, that feed into um, the main events. And I want to point out also here, um, our neighbors to the east, we really designed this very specifically so that the building itself, the, the fourth floor mass itself acts as a barrier to the activities that will happen on the roof deck and within the building. There are really no functions that will open to the east um, with the possible exception of the amenity deck that was asked about earlier. And that is in the Southeast corner. That, um, as Elaine correctly said, is meant for the use by the residents of the second and third floor. They have small balconies, but if someone wants to have a few friends over um, and do something on a little bit larger scale, it gives them the opportunity to do that um, on that fourth floor. And I want to take a moment to point out that we have, we've read letters from the neighbors. We understand um, that this is one of their concerns along with many other things. Um, and we're looking forward to developing our management plan um, with their input. Um, we're going to plan a good neighbor meeting uh, with the entire neighborhood. I imagine it would be mostly folks from, from the Walnut um, and, uh, and help them inform us for how we can best manage this space um, and be a good neighbor. I think you've got about a minute and a half. Next. 
Um, little quick thing about the sidewalk, um, sidewalk cafe. We want to create a, a sidewalk cafe and really engage the public on that corner of uh, 16th of Walnut. Next. These are the elevations of the building. The thing to point out here is just how we're modulating um, the mass, um, both vertically and horizontally. Next. Um, here's an alley elevation. Um, I don't know that we had this in our original package, but the lower elevation is of the alley and the upper elevation is how we interface with our neighbor on the east. And I wanna point out that the center section of that is hollowed out. Um, we have a light well that reaches down all the way to the ground floor. And that's what you're seeing in the center of that upper picture. Next. And then this next one here shows a little bit more how that relationship works with our neighbor to the east. Next. The materials that Josh mentioned, we are gonna be using very similar materials. Uh, we want these buildings to talk to each other and be part of a whole. Um, durable materials, brick, high quality cement board and some wood to warm things up a little bit, especially associated with the residential units. Next. And then just a few slides here of kind of some 3D views. This is looking um, along Walnut towards the corner. Next. This one is uh, looking across 16th Street, looking east. Next. And then here we just see, um, Josh pointed out how they've got this, this, this angled roof on the corner. We have a very similar roof at our upper level, again, to get these buildings to kind of speak to each other, catty corner across that intersection. Next. Kate, if you could just wrap up, please. There's a couple more here. Just a couple, the last couple shots here are just showing the relationship of the massing of our building to, particularly to the building uh, to the east of us. This one from the alley and the next one looking at it from uh, along Walnut Street and next. And this is the, the pedestrian view looking catty corner from the church back at the building. Um, and again, we're trying to create this relationship of the two projects by doing that. And that, that really ends it. We have one more at the end to show uh, where we all started, um, which is the historic chapel on the corner. We look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks to all the applicants. I'm going to bring it back to the board. And um, I know there were some board members who had some questions that were appropriately directed at the applicant. We'll start with Sarah and then John, and then uh, um, I'll take hands. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my computer kind of went out there for a moment. So I um, didn't hear the full um, explanation of the Per, of the goal of the open space on the, or the public space on the top floor. And I'd like to come back to the question about, um, uh, I know you mentioned it would be people who meet about 60% of AMI. And I'm just curious uh, to follow up on John's question of, um, is it managed by BHP? Is it managed by you? Like, how does it fit into the city's um, uh, BHP uh, affordable housing program? So I'll touch on that just real briefly and then maybe hand it over to Catherine Bean, um, who's here with Element Properties. Um, but to answer your question about that, that, that small deck on the upper level, that's meant for residents of the second and third floor, um, no, not the, as meant, part of Yeah, not the big, as part I was of actually thinking about space. the big deck. The, the purpose yeah. of the deck is uh, it's a social space for the church. Is that correct? It is um, a special event space associated with the indoor event space. So this is a place where you would have potentially wedding, uh, wedding receptions, corporate functions, it will be rented out to folks um, who desire that type of a space. And how does it differ from the, the public, the outdoor space you have on the roof deck at the church itself? It's up on the fourth floor. And it's got incredible views of the flat irons. Um, okay, it, so Doug might be able to pitch in further about how they see the, those differences, but um, the intent of the uh, fourth floor of the annex is to be a public event space that'd be rented by anyone in Boulder. And so they would have graduation events, uh, parties, whatever it might be. Uh, the event space at the church is really for more internal church functions. Uh, obviously, it could be used by community groups as well. We often host BIF, uh, Boulder Symphony, Boy Scouts, many others that use our common spaces. Okay, thank you. And then the question about the how, how the um, affordable housing uh, fits in with the Boulder, the city's uh, affordable housing program. 
So we've spoken to the city about these. We actually invited Boulder Housing Partners to, as a development partner, they chose not to join us. So mm -hmm. Element Properties is helping us development. Uh, it will be owned by the church. Uh, we'll have a separate property manager. And so we'll be working with the uh, property manager to uh, attract uh, tenants and to manage the overall uh, two floors. Okay. And the 40 units will contribute to the city's ultimate goal of uh, affordable housing. So although it's not related to BHP, it still is part of that goal. Okay, thank you. Hey, John. Yeah, uh, you mentioned, uh, Pete, about uh, balconies for each uh, apartment as well as the space on the top floor. Um, but in looking at the drawings, it wasn't obvious that each apartment had balconies. Did I misunderstand or? or? Um, I think you did. Um, each, each unit does have a balcony. It's actually part of um, the zoning requirements. And Elaine, I don't know if you still have access to the presentation, but I, if you pull up those floor plans, I can show you where they are. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to hear that they were there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, other planning board members, Lupita's got a hand up. Where's Lupita? Lupita, you unmuted, but we can't hear you. Well, if your microphone is not picking up. You know, I, I'll make an exception. If you want to just use the chat, I'll speak your question into the record, okay? You can type it and I'll speak it from the chat, all right? <laughs> you might consider um, logging out and logging back in after, uh, after the question and you hear your answer. It looks and like it's I think that's like appropriately it. Halloween if you want to channel Lupita some kind of weird sorcery way. Okay, and we're just waiting for, for Lupita's message to come through and then we'll ask it. So the question is, did you decide on one bedroom and studios format to limit the number of people per unit? What about families? Um, there was no intent to necessarily limit the number of people per unit. Um, there, the, uh, Catherine might speak to this as well, but I think the intention would be to finance, and finance, finance this in part through uh, low-income housing tax credits. And there is um, a, uh, not a hard threshold for projects that they like to see, but they definitely tend to benefit um, projects with larger unit counts. We have, a, this would be a very small light tech project act, actually. And so we're trying to um, uh, maintain a higher number of units um, to best fit into that light tech box. Um, in addition, it is a downtown site it is, um, it is, you know, it has no yard per se. Um, and so we do believe that it will um, probably attract a uh, more single and couple kind of crowd in any case. Yeah, okay. I think- Oh, you can, I can hear you, Lupita? No, who is that? This was Catherine. I just wanted to add a little bit on to what Pete said. Um, okay. He's correct in getting an investor for tax credits interested. You do need a certain number of units. Uh, so it's to benefit uh, the, the affordable project overall. And in addition, we see that our market studies as well as our lease up of our over 400 units of uh, housing, affordable housing in the city really lends itself to a need for uh, one bedrooms and studios. Those are always the first leased up that we, we find. 
And then Lupita followed up with a question, could adjacent units be connected and form a two bedroom unit more appropriate for families? Certainly that could physically be done. It would reduce the unit count, which would work against what we're trying to achieve um, for LITEC and financing purposes. Now, once the, the LITEC funds have been dispersed and the project is complete, is there any kind of reporting obligation for the government that would make it impossible to do that without you know, potentially jeopardizing the, the funds? Or is that something that once the project's built, um, you're kind of on your own? So with a, a tax credit project, um, a LORA or land use restriction agreement will be engaged upon. And that will mean that we have to keep the number of units and the area median incomes tied to those units in place for at least 25 years. And then the agreement with the city as well will require this, the number of total number of units and the area median income. So the deal is kind of baked and um, the expectation is that, and the requirement is that you keep those 40 units uh, it also helps go toward the city's ultimate goal of number of units. Great, thanks. Um, Lupito, is, is that sufficient to answer your question? Okay, she is nodding yes. Then I'm gonna go to Sarah who has her hand up. I just wanna clarify, Catherine, you, you keep saying 40 units, but the, pro the project says 30. So what is the actual number? Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I am so sorry. It is 30 and okay. I will just, I will blame it on the fact that I have twins due in two weeks. So. Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please forgive me. Jean, just so you know, um, or Cindy, Lupita's logged out. She's going to try to log back in. So if you can bring her back in with, with all of the powers of a, a planning board member, that would be great. I hope you can, we can hear her now. Okay, she's back. Lupita, can you say something? Oh, we're still not hearing anything from you. I don't know if you might have a microphone setting on your end that you can work on. In the meantime, I'm happy to keep uh, working with you through chat if we have to do it. Yeah, I think that might help. Okay. All right. Any other questions from planning board for the applicant before we, yeah, David? Yeah. I'm, I uh, had missed somehow going through the packet that there was a basement plan uh, for the annex. Uh, so um, that was interesting, uh, Pete. Um, I just was wondering, the, so there will be excavation done for that uh, basement on that side. Um, I'm sure you probably considered uh, the possibility of, of doing underground parking and did the financial <laughs> evaluation of that. But since, um, but I just want to confirm there is, will be excavation, but there was a decision made not to do underground parking just for the overall project. So is that? That is entirely correct. Um, we did investigate it. The, the lot is um, not really large enough to support um, cost-effective underground parking. Underground parking is very expensive to begin with, right. but the, um, the net that we would get on this site, because it is so tight, when you factor in the ramping, et cetera, we gain hardly any spaces, but that would be at an enormous cost. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, appreciate it. Okay, John Gerstel? Yeah, uh, just a, a question for the, for the main church buildings, along, right at the corner of Walnut and 15th, uh, along the facades of both Walnut and 15th, there doesn't seem to be any doors or significant doors or entrances to the what I guess would be the basketball court from the street itself. And I'm wondering, is, is that just something I'm missing from looking at the, uh, at the drawings? Are there intended to be significant entrances directly to the streets? There are not. And the main reason why is that's at a floor technically below grade, grade level there to get the head height that we need for gameplay in the gymnasium. That floor line is about eight feet below the street level at that location for the gym. Uh huh. Okay, well, thank you. So, so the primary circulation extends from the main lobby, which we're using as a hub, 
that circulation extends down through open stairways right at the entrance to the gym. So almost all major circulation comes up and, and through that space. And then we have exiting through separate stairways at, at opposite sides. So I guess I didn't understand where are the exits then? They are up to, you, they go up, you go upstairs, up a flight of stairs, up eight feet. We have one set of doors that's recessed and tucked back. It's actually on Walnut. That is one of the emergency egress doors, but we have shielded that from view. That's based on city staff recommendations. We pulled it back. It's recessed in, in an alcove and it's actually 90 degrees to the street. So in an elevation view, you won't see it, but it, it opens up and, and exits right out onto Walnut. Uh -huh. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Lisa? Yeah, so I'll kind of go off of um, the basement as well, and I'm sure there'll be more details in time. Um, but I was curious about kind of flood mitigation and how you're setting that up and, and how you've thought about that. And then um, also on the sustainability side, I was curious if at this point uh, in the concept plan, if you've thought about anything like solar panels or uh, other sustainable features you'd be planning to incorporate into the building, um, and if that's part of your plan. You want me? To, you all jump in here and handle the church side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, from a flood mitigation standpoint, that is that is ongoing. Um, we are obviously a, a portion of the site is in is in that flood protection zone, and that is something that is that we are working at, you know actively on on trying to figure out how to how to get the majority of this building out of that floodplain. So that is a that's an active design component that um, that we are addressing. As far as the uh, sustainable components, I mean, we're still at that concept level, um, but these sustainable components have been discussed. But as, as far as how we're going to integrate them in just yet, not quite sure. But we have a lot of opportunity, especially when it comes to solar on this project. And so I, I do think that that is something that um, our conversations have steered to. And I think it's gonna be something that we actually implement into this project. Great, thank you. I only add that on the annex parcel, the annex parcel is not within the 100 year floodplain, uh, which allows us to do the basement there without any major hiccups. And I would echo what Josh said about the sustainability side of things. We're just early yet. Peter Vitale. I was going to follow on Lisa's comment on sustainability and then um, the comment that applicant has made twice through the past two comments uh, here about sustainability that there's it's early and there's still plenty of room to go to start looking at some of the more current measures like embodied carbon the way that we're looking in that at that at various other projects that are holding some, themselves out as progressive in terms of sustainability and not just rest on solar that's great but let this be another great example you know it was said that this is a gift from god so let's be cognizant of uh this opportunity to have this be the very best steward of the environment, as well as the wonderful social equity goals that you seem to be uh, striving for. Amen to that. I'll also add that um, Chaffa, who provides the tax credits, has recently adopted a new enterprise green communities um, protocol, which includes a lot of sustainability features that we'll need to incorporate in order to obtain those those tax credits. Doug jumped in with his amen and, and Catherine with her answer before I could chide Peter for not asking a question, but it, it, it got answered anyway. <laughs> Sarah? Um, so I had a question actually on the church property. Um, you identify on the corner of uh, Canyon and 15th some green space and you, you consider it open space for the building if I'm not mistaken, currently that is enclosed and it's part of the daycare center, I think. So I'm just curious, I couldn't quite tell how that is changing. Like what's, what, how is that changing into open space? Doug, do you wanna handle that one? Yeah, so we uh, don't expect um, any change to that 15th and Canyon space other than there's been a request to widen the 
the garden space and the walkway along that canyon frontage. But the enclosed, the playground enclosure for the preschool is expected to stay there. Uh, that's kind of a requirement for the preschool. Mm -hmm. This the southeast corner, the uh, 16th in Walnut will have uh, 16th in Canyon will have considerable green space there, and that'll be incorporated in the overall uh, landscaping plan for the for the church. Okay, thank you. Maybe I just was turned around. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Any other questions from planning board? Okay. Looks like we don't have any. Um, all right. So what we do now uh, that we've heard the applicant's presentation, we've heard the staff's presentation and the board has had an opportunity to ask questions of both. Um, we're gonna go to public comment. And these are the public comments that are specific to this particular matter. I'm gonna turn it over to Jean. And Jean, if you would manage the public comment on this public hearing, thank you. Great, thanks Harmon. Um, so I've heard from several of you that you'd like to speak. This is the time to go ahead and um, use the raise hand function to let us know that you would like to speak. Um, speakers will have three minutes. Um, so I have five folks, I think, that um, Mr. Heron has indicated would like to speak. So I have Scott Heron, Peter Wells, Robin Wolf, Linda Silverthorne, and Sam P in that order. Um, so Scott Heron, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute. You've asked to go first um, and you can go ahead and start. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that I admire both the vision of the churches for Boulder with Love campaign and the help provided to the underserved of our community including the proposed provision of affordable housing in the new annex building. Unfortunately, the process of developing and presenting the pro proposal along with the design itself suggests a decision to ignore obvious known and significant, significant issues of importance to immediate neighbors and the neighborhood. Instead, a monolithic structure has been presented that neither respects nor reflects the neighborhood. My focus first is that the design ignores necessary consideration that the property borders the Chamberlain Historic District. We're appreciative that the review by the city has identified in its preliminary analysis many issues that affect the immediate neighborhood and residents of 1655 specifically. There is one comment to section 2.3a for the annex that I would respectfully request deserves further consideration. I reviewed documentation from the approval process for 1655 Walnut from 2007. There are numerous, re numerous references to the developer having worked with the city to modify the design to fit into the neighborhood. An example, the applicant has worked with planning staff, <clears throat> DAB and Landmarks Advisory Board to develop a unique plan for this site. The site is not in a designated landmark district, but is adjacent to the Chamberlain Historic District located along the south side of Walnut. The general building appearance has been made to appear as a two-story building along the Walnut frontage to blend with the existing smaller bungalows. That it is at the eastern edge of the district, adjacent to less intensive use districts, suggests very strongly that building height and mass must be made compatible with existing and planned development within the area. These comments are still right on point. Elaine referenced <clears throat> the resulting setbacks on the third and fourth floors of 1655 and alluded to the fact that the lack of a step back might impact the residents of 1655. To be clear, there is substantial impact. The design of the annex must incorporate third and fourth floor setbacks like on much of 1655 Walnut, about a 13 foot setback before the vertical rise on the third floor and a similar additional setback for the fourth floor. The four story stair tower on Walnut Street must go and any residence deck and event space be set back accordingly from Walnut Street. Very brief comments now on the event space. It has been suggested that the event space is most like the indoor amusement establishment defined in chapter 9-16. It is unclear to me how an indoor amusement establishment then results in a nearly equally sized outdoor event space. I would suggest that an indoor amusement establishment remain indoors 
without any outdoor space. We don't need a part-time Rio in the neighborhood. We're very concerned about hours of operation, noise restrictions, serving of alcohol, trash, recycling, removal, loading, parking, et cetera. And of course, the fourth floor must be stepped back significantly as discussed earlier. In conclusion, while I and others are not opposed to the concept of the new annex building, we are vehemently opposed to it as designed. Other neighbors will address other issues. We're asked not to be redundant and we'll try to respect that but we are aligned on various issues, even if we all don't mention them. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Next up, we have Peter Wells. Um, thank you very much. Um, it, it, uh, I'm a, a neighbor of Scott's in the 1655 uh, Walnut Building to the east. Um, I enjoyed seeing the, the history of uh, the Grace Commons site. It's something that, that's familiar to all in Boulder, but it was, it was really fun um, to have Elaine take us through that timeline. So it's a, it's, it's a great heritage that you're trying to protect here. Specifically, I've got some real concerns about the uh, event space on the fourth floor and as Scott mentioned, the outside space. And having looked at the city noise ordinance of uh, section 5-9-3, it breaks it down into to three zones. And I would like staff or, or planning board to clarify in your interpretation, um, obviously this is not the industrial zone, but to, in, in your estimation, does this fall into the residential or mixed use slash other category? So I, that I would like clarified. And then secondly, uh, Elaine in her presentation used the word uh, monolithic on a number of occasions. And I've got some deep concerns about the, the new mass on the corner on the Grace Commons uh, campus site, but moreover, the uh, CenturyLink building immediately to the, to the west of this proposed outdoor deck space is gonna be something that just radiates sound. And uh, having raised a child who is now a rock musician and done the garage band thing, I know about sound in, in reflected sound and decibels all too well. And so um, I would like, uh, you know, deep consideration for the fact that you not only have a roof space that's gonna be generating noise, but also you've got these, these things that are gonna radiate and reflect that noise around the neighborhood. So um, I think that, uh, and then I would like staff or board to clarify which of the two categories under 5-9-3, this project will fall into. Peter, is that, are you concluding your comments? Uh, yeah, but, but I, I guess I'm, I'm concluding it, but I'm also asking the, the, the question that I guess I, I think myself and others would, would like that clarified because the two different uh, 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 noise zones have, have deeply different decibel limits for both the daytime and the 11 p.m. to 7 p.m. night quote nighttime hour uh, limits. Great. Typically, we'll go through all of the um, public hearing comments and then the board and the applicants. The board can ask the applicants to address, um, to respond to some of the comments. So if you could um, wrap up yours, we'll keep moving through this and then we can address some of those okay, I'll, I'll, I'll yield there, Gene, thank you. Gene, I'm gonna Thanks. jump in for a minute here. Um, so typically we, we are not in the business of engaging in a colloquy um, between, between planning board and members of the public during public comment. It's your opportunity to comment. Um, if if uh, individual members of planning board pick up on any of the questions that you're asking and want those answers for themselves, they may. This is also a concept review. And it's a perfect time for you to, you asked a lot of questions. It's a perfect time for you to draft those questions up in an email to staff and send them in and get an answer. Um, and, and we can also have that email forwarded to all the members of planning board. Uh, thanks for clarifying that, Harman. I appreciate that. Okay, Jean, go ahead. Okay, so next up we have Robin Wolf. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, Robin. Okay, great. Thank you all for letting us speak at this event. Um, my main concern, Scott and Peter and several other homeowners are going to talk about specific items in the design. 
so that we're not repetitive, but there is a consensus amongst all the homeowners. We have uh, serious concerns that everybody is bringing up individually. As a group, we have those concerns. My specific concern that I'm going to speak with is the amenity deck on the southeast corner on the, on the fourth floor. And it's called an amenity deck, but with all due respect, Peter, I think um, it could be called an event space in its own because 30 homeowners potentially could be hosting parties or events up on that rooftop space, which is directly adjacent to my bedroom, my patio, Scott's bedroom and patio. And those people could very easily um, jump a fence and be on our rooftop deck, which then has access to many other units. So I think that the, the, the city's downtown design guidelines um, direct the city to consider context when integrating open space into building design. And this is completely not contextual to, to what's happening around it. Um, I think it's completely inappropriate that this amenity deck or event space can be happening so close to people's units, basically at a zero lot line. And speaking of contextual, uh, you know, uh, evaluation, I think that the event space itself is completely inappropriate for a residential neighborhood. You've got historic homes right across the street. You've got residential neighborhood that is going to be listening to the to whatever these events that are going to be hosted up there. And it's just inappropriate for its location. Uh, that's my main concern and it's reflected by all the homeowners at the Walnut. Oh, one last thing, because somebody might not be speaking to this. We're all very concerned where the HVAC units will be located on the annex, because as we, we all know that the sound from the HVAC can uh, bounce off of walls and affect our sound levels in our condos. So we're concerned where they're going to be located and if there will be a wall around them to mitigate the sound. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Next up, we have Linda Silverthorne, and after that, Sam P., um, followed by Lynn Siegel. Linda, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to, again, thank the board for allowing us to speak, and I would like to stand with my other Walnut Condos homeowners. I support all what they have said. What I'm going to speak about is parking and alley concerns. Um, we've done a count, and obviously it's a you know, an eyeball thing, but we counted um, about 37 parking spaces at the church currently. And my understanding is that's gonna go down to about half of that. Um, I haven't counted how many parking spaces are at the annex right now, but my concern is 30 apartment building, 30 apartments, three commercial um, first floor and then event spaces. Um, I just don't see, I understand, that you're trying to encourage alternative methods of transportation, but I don't see people parking in the parking garage. They don't do it now. They don't do it when they come to church. They park in front of our building um, pre-COVID, obviously. When there's a church service, you can't park anywhere near our building. Um, so uh, the owners at this building have a lot of concerns related to the fact that there's not gonna be enough parking. And I was disappointed to hear that they looked into building a parking garage like our building was required to do and have decided not to. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the alley condition. I was on the board for our condos for seven years approximately. So I have a lot of experience working with the city, working with the church, working with the church on behalf of the annex, et cetera. Um, we have people on a probably weekly at this point because of COVID, um, occurrence where they park, park in front of our garage. So our only access out is through the alley and it is often um, we go to come out and we can't. Um, the second issue we have is, and I've reported, we report this to the city, but the parking um, people come by and then 
someone's moved or whatever. Um, people park in the spots that are marked no parking all the time. Um, the food delivery, so all of the shops on Pearl that have deliveries, the dr delivery trucks park in the alley with their blinkers and they don't really worry about blocking us. Um, the other concern I have is that we have asked the city for help in keeping this alley repaired. We've requested a concrete alley. Um, we were denied. We've requested that it be repaved. We were denied. With the best we get when we have potholes is that hot tar gravel stuff that lasts about a week. Um, and the other thing is that the alley isn't plowed. And during the winter, it's just a big sheet of ice. And the, ent the exit on to 17th is a big puddle. So the water doesn't drain. So it's and we have someone in our building who's blind. So it's a really bad situation and I can only understand that that is gonna get a lot worse. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Linda. Next up is Sam P followed by Lynn Siegel followed by Kevin Eggleston and then we'll have Grant Couch and Claudia Hanson Thien. Okay, so Sam P, you can go ahead. Sam, you can go ahead. All right, now can you hear me? You can, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I suspect I have concerns that are maybe not backed by the rest of the board members, but I'd still like to address them. Um, I am very concerned that the housing is provided by a church, especially in a state, in a country where churches do not pay tax. Um, this country is generally founded upon the principle of separation of church and state and the city supporting or endorsing or even funding a church deeply disturbs me. Um, I, I would like to know how the church plans to separate its finances between the annex and the uh, main church and how they will fund that differently. Um, I'd also be very curious to know if they're going to put any restrictions on the residents who live there. Are they going to have to ascribe to the religious principles of the church? The um, are they going? Mentioned. Sorry? Yeah. There was some sort of thing for building. Sam, you can I, keep. I, I'm sorry. I, I think someone I, I, else. I'm sorry. I can't. Okay. Um, I apologize. I, I, um, so I, I am concerned that the, um, the, the funding for the housing and the tax credits for the housing may actually go to fund the church, and that might end up being government-sponsored church. This may not be the place to address this, but I, I'd like to know wh why, why we encourage a religious organization to build housing um, in a situation where, uh, I don't know, where, where we have, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to speak here and I apologize, but I, I am just very uncomfortable with churches providing housing and providing and getting money from the city to do that or um, extra considerations in the planning board situation. Um, and I, I just don't want people to be excluded from housing because they don't agree with the religious beliefs of the church or be excluded from the spaces because they don't agree with the religious uh, views of the church. So I, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you, Sam. Next up is Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you can go ahead and unmute. Sam, I don't know you from Adam, but I'm under your skin. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, the guy from the church is not on the screen anymore. I don't have a list of participants, so I can't know who I'm addressing. Again, Jean, this needs to be corrected. Eight months ago. <laughs> okay, that guy said, God said that this church was supposed to be taken this way. No, sorry. People make churches. People make structures. Not God. He doesn't have construction experience. Um, I'm sorry I was born on the wrong continent. I was just discussing this with a neighbor today. In Europe, they don't have philanthropic organizations. Philanthropy is the barometer 
of social injustice. And that is the absolute truth. And LIHTC funds, well, those are part of our federal government doing its bidding, growing this country as fast and as big and as higher as it can. Now, the corner of 15th and Walnut, that's obscene. That ship shape, you know, I'm from the coast. We don't build buildings like that there. If you want a ship, go to the coast, <laughs> you know, be, and go in a ship. But don't try to look like you've got an ocean around you. That is obscene at that corner. That is ugly, ugly. You know, <laughs> God forbid, I'm from Seattle and from Palo Alto and, and I've seen good architecture. And I hate to see Boulder having to look at a building for 300 years because they're built to last that long. That looks like that. You know, it's like the prison industrial complex condos on 21st and Pearl. You know, and what we need from these architects is 3D renderings, video, 3D, up and down, up and down, screening the whole building, the whole outline of everything, pointing with a cursor what this is, what that is, what the other thing is, because it's this is not planning board you and the architects, and this is not about um, this one guy that's supposed to send you his comments, Harmon. This is about the community. We wanna know what people are thinking, and we need an iterative process here to understand each other and evolve a project rather than just see what it's been dished up to us. Now, I'm sorry that I'm in the life sciences, you know, but also Harmon, I got to tell you, you're working Gilpin, Coburn's there, JVA's there, it's here. There are associations and I don't care, Hella, if he says that he's going to do the right thing. I'm glad I didn't take my debate experience in high school and take it to law school. I'm glad I'm in the health sciences if that's what law is. Now I'm not from this neighborhood, but Lynn, this is a know. big fat nope, nope. And that's Yiddish probably, Harmon. Like, um, what's the other term today that I determined was, was Yiddish? Thank you, Lynn. Um, Okay, next up is Kevin Eggleston, followed by Grant Couch, followed by Claudia. Okay, Kevin, you may go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of 1655, and we as residents, I just want to emphasize that we designated Scott and um, Robin to speak uh, uh, on main points and concerns that we all share in the building about the development um, next to us. Also regarding the HVAC noise and any noise coming off the roof, uh, because 1655 is uniquely designed with a courtyard, the noise um, transmission from the rooftop of the new building, uh, the new annex, the replacement for the annex, could cause significant problems for us here. So I'd like the uh, folks who are doing the design to take that into consideration. Uh, appreciate the time you've taken with us and the details that you've provided with us. And I'll add any other questions by email. Kevin, thank you very much. Um, next, we have Grant Couch and Claudia Hanson Theme. And I would just like to remind of any of the, uh, we, I think we have one phone in, one phone call in listener. If you would like to speak um, to the board, you can use star nine to raise your hand. Okay, Grant, let's see. Grant, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay. Um, I just want to first say, I'm a, yes, first I'm 1655 resident and I concur with all of the concerns that, that, that my fellow residents have expressed. But I really want to say also how much I appreciate the effort that you board members and staff have put into this. It's a very impressive presentation. I also appreciate the church's desire to uh, serve the city and, and to provide low income housing. I think that's important. Uh, but I am I'm very concerned about the, the issues that my neighbors have raised. I think setbacks very important. 
I think the open space on the on the uh, event on the fourth floor is a big concern. I mean, if there's going to be an event space up there and there needs to be a deck, it might be 15% or 10% of the total floor space as opposed to 50% of it, for example. Um, I think one thing I want to be explicit about too, in terms of the transitional impact when this construction is going on is that I hope it's being designed well in a way that doesn't close off this alley for major portions of the day or really any portions of the day. Staging this development is going to be very difficult. As, as Linda said earlier, our access is quite limited and that back alley is critical for us to get in and out. The garbage trucks go through and all kinds of other things too. So I hope that's being taken into consideration. But the most important points are the setbacks for third and fourth floor. The event space needs to be indoor as opposed to outdoor. And I am not comfortable at all. I mean, I appreciate, I think it was, I'm not sure who the developer was, maybe it was Peter, that he wants to sit down with the neighbors and really hear what our concerns are. I don't really think that that's where we're supposed to be positioning ourselves to plead with someone who's already got a business development to do something that we need. We need the city to make sure that it's organized and restricted in a way that doesn't make us have to beg someone who's got bottom line interests to do what's the right thing for the neighborhood. So again, thank you all for the tremendous effort you clearly put into this. And for you board members who volunteer your time to do this, thank you, I really appreciate it. And thanks for letting me speak. Thank you very much, Grant. Okay, next we have um, Claudia Hansen theme. Claudia, you can go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you, Jean. Good evening, members of the planning board. This is Claudia Hansen theme. I live in North Boulder. Um, I'm excited to see this proposal coming from an institution with such deep roots and commitment to Boulder and the downtown community. Like a lot of cities, Boulder has a lot of religious congregations in the downtown area, and many of them face a challenge of reinventing themselves as populations and cultural norms shift. And I think this is a positive move to revitalize a church campus and also provide significant benefit to the larger community. I recognize that a lot of the concern tonight turns on architectural and design issues, and I'm going to leave that to the professionals. Instead, I just want to say a few things about the general concept here. Starting with housing, I strongly support the opportunity to create permanently affordable housing downtown. It's a particular need in this part of the city, and it's also a difficult thing to do given land values in the downtown area. So I would urge you in whatever you advise tonight to protect the feasibility of housing and as much of it as possible on this site um, in whatever you ask of the applicants going forward. And also please give those housing residents access to the same kinds of amenities which happen to be shared in an affordable building that their wealthier neighbors already have for their own private use. I'm also excited to see taller buildings, lesser setbacks and stronger facades in this area of downtown. This is absolutely an area where higher intensity land use is in order and this section of Walnut could really use some more activation on the street. It often feels like a bit of a ghost town at least during the times of day and week that I pass through. And finally, I think the parking reduction is in order particularly given the parking district model in place downtown. Um, in fact, I'd argue that it's somewhat disappointing to see dedicated surface parking at all um, in proposals in this area. We've turned over a lot of downtown space to cars. We are trying to change a culture of driving in this city and I think we should be brave here. That's really all I have tonight. Uh, like I said, I know there's design issues to be worked out, particularly with regard to the neighbors to the east. But as a concept, I think this is really exciting and the big pieces are definitely heading in the right direction. I think this will be an asset to both downtown and the larger community. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We have one more, uh, Silvana Galbetti. Silvana, you can go ahead. Hi, everybody. Can can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. So I'm abroad, and I just would like to. I'm also a resident, and I'm speaking from Brazil right now. <laughs> And, but I'm a resident of the 
and sorry about my English. <laughs> I have a broken English. So, and I'm a resident from the, the Walnut and I would like to express my, first to thank my neighbors for, and I agree with them, with everything what they said. And also to express my, that I'm really, I'm strict, extremely concerned I will be one of the ones uh, also um, impacted. I one of my apartment is also on the third floor, so my main concern is the noise, the age, the HVA noise, and the the open space. So and I I sent a a, a number of questions uh, to um, Aileen. And I think she will uh, address to the to Peter. I, I don't I don't uh, uh, but uh, and uh, and I would like I I also would like to thank the opportunity to speak and also to the presentation that you did for all, all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvana. I see no other hands raised. If anyone else would like to participate and address the board, could uh, please use the raise hand function now or star nine on the phone. Seeing none, Harmon, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, well, we have uh, a policy of giving the applicant three minutes to rebut if, uh, or just to add um, any kind of answers to things that came up during the, um, during the public comment. Uh, so I'm gonna offer that time to the applicant. And then uh, being that we've been sitting here close to two hours, we'll take a break before we come back and deliberate. So uh, applicant, you have three minutes of rebuttal if you'd like to use them. Otherwise we'll take a break now. I just really have more of a comment than anything. I. Um... I want to point out to the community at 1655 that we really do want to hear from you. Um, we really do want to engage with you. Um, the bottom line associated um, with Grace Commons might be a little different than what you're used to on the stock market. Um, and, um, and I really appreciate, and I'm sure the planning board does too, the, the coordinated effort on the part of the 1655 residents. Um, your comments are thoughtful. They are um, uh, well put and respectful. And um, I think I can speak for our whole team. They really appreciate that and look forward to talking with you further. Thanks, Peter. It doesn't look like anyone else on your team is, is jumping up to say anything. So I'll give them a, a chance to do so. Okay. Um, then I'd like to take a, a five minute break uh, and then we will start deliberating at eight o'clock. Lupita, if you wanna try your mic now, um, see if you, you'll be able to speak during deliberation. Yeah, I, can you hear me this time? Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect, I have to reboot. Thank you, David. Okay, good job. All righty, we'll see you guys back at eight o'clock.
it's uh, just after eight. Uh, I'd like to get going. Are there any planning board members for whom it would be useful to ask a question um, of staff or the applicant prior to starting our deliberation? Or can we just get into our deliberation now? See David's hands up. Go ahead, David. All right. I uh, Yeah, I did um, look at the uh, muni code and um, wasn't able to immediately uh, determine whether the DT5 zone, which category it fits into uh, with regards to noise. And I just wondered if anybody on staff happened to have looked over there and has an answer for that one. You know, David, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but I can look it up real quick. Okay, thank you. you bet. I, I looked at it. I think it would be falling into the mixed other category because it had three categories, residential, industrial, and mixed other. Um, and then the definition indicated that it would be a commercial district. So it's since it's not listed, commercial districts are not listed separately, it would fall into mixed other. That's typically how we've interpreted it. Yeah, that's kind of what I was uh, assuming would be the answer. Thank you for that. Okay, great job. Any other questions, John? Yeah, I wanted to ask staff, uh, what sort of uh, arrangements to limit noise from uh, these uh, fourth floor areas might be. Are we, uh, can we put a condition saying, for example, that there can be no amplified music or, or loudspeakers there? Yeah, and that's something that would come out of the management plan that they would have to do for the use review. And uh, just as a point of clarification, um, that indoor um, amusement establishment is probably the closest um, use category that we could come up with. <clears throat> it includes things like uh, reception and banquet facilities. However, through the use review, we would be able to analyze impacts from <clears throat> things like outdoor, um, any of the outdoor deck operating characteristics. So it's, it's not exclusive of that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just ate a chocolate chip cookie. It was awesome, my husband just made. But um, anyway, um, so the point is through that process, um, the management plan would need to put in place specific criteria about amplified music and such and hours of operation when things like bottles and cans are taken outside to recycling. Um, and then that becomes part of uh, the development agreement that gets signed. Hopefully that answers your question, John. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, John, you have another? Yeah, another question, just a quick one. And that is regarding the, uh, the exit to uh, Walnut Street from the, uh, from the basketball floor that I inquired of, uh, about previously. Um, I'm trying to understand what the uh, code requirements are for exits uh, in public places like that, uh, that, that might uh, be related to this sort of an issue. Uh, so we didn't look specifically at the, the code requirement, building code requirement for exiting, but we did bring up concerns just as you had that there wasn't um, doors or windows on that corner. And so um, I'm not 100% sure what the applicant was intending um, with that exit, but I think that's something that we could still work through. And it sounds like the applicant team is still developing some concepts to make that a little bit more transparent, add more fenestration on that corner. Thank you. Okay. Great. Any more questions before we can move on and begin our deliberations? David, we'll have to unmute. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. And uh, um, I, I think that it was interesting that um, it came up. Um, there, there were some questions about uh, when a, a church owns a property and then it's a property management company then uh, uh, does affordable housing on that. 
Um, this is an uncharted territory, right, Kurt? We've we, we've done this before. I, I guess attention homes is the only one, but um, there, I, I think uh, you know it, it, it's kind of a separate financial uh, endeavor from the church, and uh, and and we just kind of benefit uh, from the church's involvement in helping make it happen. So any comments you might have to help the public understand how that works, be useful. That's correct, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll address one aspect, and Catherine will can probably um, address another aspect as well. So. Um, uh, um, Element also is a partner uh, at uh, uh, Trinity Lutheran Church where affordable housing was built there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so this, um, this is not a new uh, approach within the city. Um, and, and churches actually can be um, good partners. Um, that's been shown throughout the country with affordable housing, particularly because they're, they own a lot of land in areas where affordable housing works. Um, so we have a, um, with, within my department, we have, um, um, we have staff that um, basically regulate affordable housing. So they inspect affordable housing um, throughout the year, th uh, throughout our city. Um, they ensure that policies are being adhered to. Um, it could be HUD policies, um, our own policies, and that they, um, abide by the guidelines um, that all affordable housing needs to um, uh, abide by. And um, so I'll let Catherine talk um, a bit about um, um, how that works for them as um, sort of um, the management partner um, in, in that type of relationship though. Thanks, Kurt. It's a, it's a good question. Um, and I, I think Kurt made the great point that the sort of development of part of churches with these great downtown assets uh, redeveloping into affordable housing is happening across the country. So even just this week, I got an email about a faith-based development initiative nationwide. Um, <clears throat> in Boulder and with this project, there'll be two layers of protection. So with the low-income housing tax credits, all projects are subject to the fair housing and equal opportunity laws. And so there'll be no discrimination based on sex, religion, race. And then we layer in the bolder um, requirements as well, which extend even further than the national requirements. So by partnering with the city, we have in that extra layer of protection. Um, I'll also add that these will be um, separate LLCs from the church. And that's required because you bring in the tax credit partner who is a large owner. And then it will also be the property manager will be yet another party um, who we haven't determined yet, but um, it won't be done internally by the church. So there are a lot of laws and then checks and balances throughout to make sure that this is, this is housing for our community on the whole. Does that, does that answer your question, uh, David? Yes, it does. Thank you. I, I, uh, okay. I definitely wanted us to hear that because um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to understand why we see this model and, and that it has been well thought out. Thank you for that. Okay, that's a good addition to the conversation. Are there any other questions from the board? Is that a yes, Sarah? It's not actually a question, it's just an addition to what Kurt and, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I blanked on the name Catherine. of the one. Catherine, thank you. Um, the CHAFA and the city permitting processes are not always in sync and it's just super important to bear that in mind going forward so that uh, you don't end up with an approved plan that ha by CHAFA that hasn't yet been approved by the city. We've had that. Absolutely. Situation. Yeah, we've, we've taken that into consideration and we've had many conversations with Chaffa as well, just talking about when to bring in a project and we're gonna have it fully entitled before taking it into Chaffa. So we fully agree with you. Peter. Thank you. I wanted to ask staff if there's any record of they've had any experience with um, people jumping um, from rooftop uh, to rooftop. 
in a situation like this? That's a good question. I, I'm not familiar with that, Charles or Hella. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it either. Okay, thank you. Okay, unless, unless anybody has really substantive questions for staff, I'd like to get the deliberation. David, do you, do you have anything you need to know before we can start deliberating? I, I, I did have um, one and I, I apologize, but um, I think that um, I, it's because I think the, the neighbors did such a good job of presenting and had such uh, interesting things to say. Uh, it did bring up some things. And the, the last one that I had was, um, we do, <coughs> I'm sorry, we do see uh, alleyways come into play uh, a lot of times with downtown residential developments. And it does seem like, um, you know, the DCS covers curb cuts and things like that really well on streets. Um, uh, sometimes I feel like, um, I wonder if we are a little light on addressing uh, alleyway impacts uh, when we have additional traffic from uh, new development. And I just wondered if that is something that we have looked at or if, if staff has any insights into that before we deliberate. Thank you. When you say impacts, just additional uh, traffic that's going through the alleys? Yeah, additional traffic and the additional turning into a, a, a new lot, that kind of thing uh, that might occur. Um, I just find that, um, that, that sometimes it seems like um, those people tend to get concerned about them. And I'm just not really aware of whether the city has ways to automatically address those or if it's just sort of, uh, uh, you know, based on the need to repair the pavement, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, maintenance, you know, we have scheduled maintenance and when we hear about, you know, huge potholes that are, you know, results of heaving from freeze thaw cycles, you know, we'll get out there and patch them, but resurfacing um, of alleys is on a CIP schedule. So um, as far as maintenance goes, as far as um, intensity or level of activity in alleys, um, we don't really regulate that. Um, alleys really serve a service function. And I think that's um, how they've been looked at, especially downtown, um, particularly in the mixed use environment where you may have deliveries kind of coexisting with people who, you know, live either above um, a restaurant or a retail uh, business or adjacent to it. So um, it, they're typically self-governed, Dave. We really don't have much um, as far as, um, other than just regular maintenance, um, uh, management of the alleys, we really don't have much um, structure to that. Thank you very, that, that really helps me understand where we're at with that, appreciate it. Terrific, okay, let's move on to um, our deliberation. And uh, the, the two key issues that staff's identified are, does the project on balance meet the relevant policies of the comp plan and is the proposed project consistent with the downtown urban design guidelines for the non-historic district. And so we'll start with the first one first, but I would suggest that as planning board members think about this deliberation, you know, you know that this application is gonna need, if it goes any further, a, an approval of a site review and an approval of a use review. So think about the, the kinds of things that come up when we do site reviews and use reviews, because those are gonna be the key uh, pieces to give advice on to this applicant. So I'll uh, start with just uh, the, the comp plan compliance question. Um, and we won't do negative polling because we're not voting. It's just an opportunity for folks to speak. So whoever wants to start, raise your hand. John. Well, I, I, uh, I think that this is generally compliant with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan uh, objectives. And I think the staff comments are, are quite appropriate and I agree with them. Other thoughts? David? Yeah, I'll agree with John. I, um, I, I, uh, I think that the staff um, and Elaine, thank you so much uh, for all the, the coverage of the Bold Valley Comp Plan uh, criteria. Uh, that the staff uh, very well outlined the ones that are quite well met and the ones that will need a little bit of work going towards site review. Uh, I would um, certainly uh, say that we, given the the level of parking reduction, and uh, we'll need a good transportation management plan, uh, given the uh, 
rooftop deck will need a good uh, uh, management plan for that use. Uh, we'll need to see things, uh, concerns like where the HVAC is located uh, addressed. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that I think um, came out uh, uh, in the presentation and the, and the com public comment that, that, you know, needs to be worked out. But in general, I think it, it, it's going to be a wonderful addition to the downtown mix and, uh, and will conform quite well uh, to the aspirations of the comp plan. Any other thoughts on comp plan compliance before we move on to more design oriented topics? And I'll just say the, the second key issue was queued up as the project proposed project consistent with the downtown urban design guidelines for the non-historic district. And, um, and so I would invite, I would invite the board to expand on that. Um, the, the historic district uh, does encompass the church property, which is half of this project, um, not the annex. The annex is subject to the non-historic guidelines but also think about the, um, the site review criteria for design massing, things like that, parking reduction. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to give advice in all of those areas, as well as just this more narrow uh, second key issue. So um, who would like to start? Sarah? Thank you, Harmon. So first I'd like to say that I agreed with literally everything Elaine put in the uh, in the report to us, um, particularly the concerns about the lack of, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly what the language was, but that all along uh, 15th Street and that corner of 15th going on to Walnut is quite, lacks, lacks transparency and is just a, a, a blank facade in many ways. And I think that's something that uh, I would really encourage the applicants to um, figure out how to address that. Um, <clears throat> I happen to agree with the comments that that glass prow at 15th and Walnut seems odd. Um, that's just a, perhaps that's just an aesthetic judgment, but um, uh, I did not love it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the annex, um, I happen to th feel strongly that because it faces the Chamberlain Historic District, it really should be subject to setbacks uh, so that uh, the residential area across the street is not facing a, a, a wall of 55 feet. Um, at the same time, I appreciate the 25 foot spacing um, uh, that you all have have, uh, have uh, placed in there so that it, it fits with the downtown design guidelines. Um, I, uh, so the setbacks, I, I just wanna reiterate, I think the neighbors have legitimate concerns as would the people who live across the street about a um, large public gathering space uh, that is essentially connected or could be connected to their apartments. I, I realize this happens in, uh, in areas where you're building apartment buildings next to each other, but um, if there is any way at all to reimagine that uh, top floor um, space to better protect the neighbors, I think that would be an appropriate thing to do. And maybe with setbacks, or even if it's just setbacks uh, for part of the building, uh, I think it would be appropriate. Um, those, those are my comments. Lisa? Um, great, yes, yeah, so I agree with the planning board members who've gone before me um, and Elaine, as Sarah just said. And so I guess I'll offer some more specific feedback. Um, Regarding kind of surface parking and then also the open space and green space for the public, um, I would dearly love to see, as has already been mentioned, some of that parking either moved into an underground parking structure. I understand pro forma restrictions and site restrictions, but um, that would definitely make me feel a little more excited. I hate to see uh, a, a location like this have that much surface parking. Um, and if not fully undergrounded, then tuck under or something, as was also mentioned, would be great. A lot of the renderings are kind of 
inspiration images we saw for the public space, um, probably just because of what got picked, uh, had a lot of fixed, um, fixed kind of seating and things like that. And I would strongly encourage movable street furniture to be incorporated as well. Um, you know, there's lots of old research on that and new research that shows that that will activate the space much better. Uh, and then just making sure, and I think it will be, but if you start changing some of the parking around, making sure that those um, green spaces and sh shared public spaces are accessible and visible from the street and people can, you know, see them and access them so that they don't become a private park. Um, uh, and then overall, you know, from a historic perspective, I think we'll we'll hear a lot more from other boards and even other board members on here. Um, uh, but overall, it, it seemed appropriate to me. It seemed appropriate with the comp plan and all of that, um, the kinds of buildings that we're seeing from the 50s and 70s um, versus early concept plans, which I might have specific design notes that I like and don't like. Um, but overall, it seems like an improvement on what's there, uh, both in terms of usage and uh, scale. Frankly, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see it going a bit higher. Um, it doesn't really make sense in that location to just have a single story. Uh, and then service parking, mobile furniture, um, ditto on the transparency. I know that that's already something you're seeking to address. Um, that's great. And I'm excited to see the next version of that. Uh, and then I also had the same note again, I know it's probably going to affect pro forma and maybe potentially financing for affordable housing. Um, but a step down toward Chamberlain. It, it would also just look better. I mean, not just that it's appropriate from the historic thing, but you kind of get a very sharp cutoff. Um, and I'd love to see that as a step down if it can possibly be done. Thank you. Anybody want to jump in? Peter? I agree with comments before and wanted to add and echo Sarah's point about the glass prow well, I do agree that the block is ready for something that caught my eye as something out of place with the character and not fitting with the historic nature and then the general design. Um, the use of that design, it, it's something about that that did not seem to fit with the neighborhood and the, uh, the block. So I, I can't put it into words, but Sarah brought it up and I Thank her for that, and I want to echo that. David? Oh, wait, did Lisa, did you need to follow up, or can I go to David? Go ahead. I'll be quick. I, I, I just, I was just going to say, because I, I also found it to be kind of a startling visual representation, but at the same time, I know that some of our most beloved buildings have weird and interesting things going on. Um, and whatever happens with that design, I was just going to say maybe there are other perspectives or ways to show how that tower perhaps echoes the historic chapel's tower. Like, I wonder if that was like one of the kind of guiding principles. And, and I, I wonder if there might be a way to echo that in a more modern form. So um, I, it, that does just something that occurred to me as listening. I was like, wait a second, maybe I know what they're trying to do there. But um, I agree that, that the way it's done right now, it's, it's very visually impactful. And I think whenever you do that, you get people who like it and people who don't. Um, and so it might need a little refinement. Thank you, David. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Lisa. That's a perfect segue into what I was going to do is kind of build on that as well. Um, sometimes at concept review time, we see things that are, you know, kind of have some ideas of what we will want to see, but they look a little off. And this is a really amazing spot uh, to that has a great opportunity for something really impactful. Uh, so if if we look at that and we say, well, we're going to see something impactful, but if it it can be if it, if it uh, evolves to something maybe a little bit uh, more exciting or that just uh, seems to resonate with us more, that would be wonderful. And, uh, and I think that uh, the um, design review, or the DAB review of this uh, will, will really help with that, um, I hope, and uh, uh, help get some additional comments from, from real, really uh, knowledgeable architects. And I did want to just briefly talk about that stretch along 15th with the above ground parking. Uh, that um, there, is, there, there should be some pretty interesting opportunities potentially, even if the parking configuration isn't changed significantly to do something along there. Um, you know, one thing that just came to my mind was uh, these wonderful street wise murals that popped up a couple months ago um, that we're all enjoying. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, 
um, just to screening between the parking lot and the street that would accommodate some community-based public art projects or things, you know, just something something to break up uh, just looking into a parking lot. And I do realize that once you do go past the parking lot, there is a, a fairly gracious entryway there. So it's not completely nothing, but, uh, but it could use a little breaking up. And so um, I think that, that that was just something that came to my mind. Um, as far as the, I'm going to go ahead and just say that this is DT5. I realize that we we like to offset. We like to <laughs> we like to try to uh, create more space, uh, but it, but it is our most intense area. And uh, I, I I I well, I do um, absolutely um, understand the concerns about trying to be as gracious to the Chamberlain, which is across the street. Uh, to the south, um, I just want to be also acknowledge that uh, in this zone we are expecting uh, fairly intensive uses to come up, and so I'm not quite as maybe uh, adamant that I would have to see um, extensive setbacks. But um, but I, I so I just wanted to kind of counter that a little bit. Uh, but I understand that some people would really like to see that. So uh, I think that's all I had to add. Okay, um, John Gerstel. Yeah, thank you. Well, David, until that last remark, I was going to say it was uh, almost unusual that I agreed with everybody on on the board. <laughs> Hardly ever happens. But uh, I, I do agree with all the comments that have gone before, also with what's happening at the corner of 15th and, uh, and Walnut there with the prominent uh, visual tower. I I think that that is a good place for something exciting to happen, and I'm not sure that uh, what what has been presented here tonight is is that, but that can be developed further. But my other comment was that I think that the idea of having some setback on the annex building uh, at the top floor is something that should be considered. I think that would really, I understand that that implies a sacrifice to how many units might be available within. But I think that the visual impact might be very beneficial and should be considered carefully. Lupita. Um, so my comment is very simple. I, I've been listening well, and one of the things that I noticed early on was that that one corner where the uh, the core will be taken, you know, um, will be underground. Uh, I think it's an opportunity to maybe envision what other places have done. So I have lived in places where uh, spending an evening watching kids playing basketball or even grown-ups playing basketball is the way to spend a Saturday night or even a Sunday night. Um, I'm wondering, and by allowing a little bit more um, what more glazing to be able to look in into that area would allow for some of the younger members of our community to enjoy that corner and the church also provide a more um, more engaging uh, service to the community where they can promote a gathering for young people in those kind of places and, and so along with that the other concern that I had about that particular corner one is that it could be leveraged more. The other one is, is um, the exit the, or the lack of an, um, I, will, I will think an emergency exit worked out somehow, uh, hopefully very inconspicuously, uh, will be good uh, for safety reasons. And other than that, all of my colleagues have made excellent points and I think that um, I don't need to um, repeat them, but I think that these are the things that I would like to um, recommend um, the proponents to look into it. Uh, you know, there, there are models uh, in other countries where things become very lively and in a very community-based and, and very, uh, at a very low cost. You just go and watch people. Thank you. Yeah, we could use some more of that in Boulder. That's a good point. Um, Though the Pearl Street Mall is a pretty great place to do that. 
Um, but you know, some private spaces where you can do that as well. What a nice idea. Um, so I actually uh, don't have a single gripe with the, uh, the analysis in the staff report of the, um, the conformity with the guidelines. Um, so I'm gonna support all of that. I also essentially agree with everything that every member of planning board has said. And, and to the extent that um, I don't, it'll become clear with, with what I say now. Uh, I'm gonna break my comments up into the church site and the annex building, um, starting with the church building. And, and, and I'm gonna start with just kind of off the cuff. Um, you know, with, uh, with the issue about not wanting to do uh, underground parking and the expense of the underground parking, combined with the issue of not necessarily wanting to do setbacks because we're trying to get as much um, in the way of construction, in the way of units. One sec. I hate it. A call comes in through the computer right when you're right when you're talking. Hasn't happened all night. Um, so there, there's some interplays there. Um, and one, one interplay that might work, uh, and I don't know if you've considered this, if the applicants considered this, is that we're nowhere near the far limitation on the church side. And, you know, it's possible that adding some residential on the church side and pulling some units out of the 1603 building would solve problems and maybe, um, maybe also give, give you the thought that you could get a lot of units on the church side, liven that side up and maybe make underground parking pencil, just a concept. Um, let me get to, to sort of my aesthetic comments around um, the guidelines and, and the site review criteria. So for the church um, side, the, the gray block corner treatment uh, without any openings or windows or doors at ground level is unusual. And I don't think in a really good way as a plinth for that glass above it um, I think work needs to be done to avoid large featureless uh, facade surfaces. Um, the intention to add accessory uses like the indoor gym, meeting rooms, and event space is really good. Um, the eclecticism, the varied massing, the angularity, and the repetition of the main lobby motif in the small courtyard lobby, they're all nice features. They, they mirror some of the styling cues from the 19th century church in my, in my opinion. Um, but also, in my opinion, the, uh, the new design pieces lack the solidness, the solidity, and the felicitous proportionality of the original building, the old church. So I think, you know, the, the comment from staff around the, uh, the, the sort of flying um, supports that go up to the roof of the glass box, uh, not really landing on appropriately massive columns, um, you know, maybe right, maybe not right, but the, the, the overall feeling for me is just that there, the proportions aren't exactly right yet. And, and if, if you work on those and take a few more cues from the original building, which is actually pretty awesome, um, I think we may come up with something a bit better. Uh, so it could just use some additional work. I, I also agree with staff's assessment of the aesthetic and functional issues with the lack of awnings, the location of the trash enclosure and the legibility of the organization of the building's Northwest side. Jumping over to the annex building at 1603 Walnut. Um, I, I agree that there should be a setback on the top floor, at least a better design to respect the relationship to 1655 Walnut, the neighbor to the West. Um, you know, enclosing some of that space, uh, might actually be a, a nice thing, you know, a, a very, you know, attractive wall um, to keep the, the amenity area more, more enclosed might, might do the trick. I don't know. Um, the annex site is a mixed use project with residential above and the church functions and a small restaurant on ground floor is appropriate. Uh, the relationship of the first floor uses and the design, um, the way that it, it, it meets the sidewalk is well done and well scaled on that building. Um, I do think additional measures should be taken to avoid impacts on neighboring properties from the roof deck. I think developing a management plan and having good neighbor policies are really important 
They don't seem to me like holding a gun to someone's head. Um, but I do think that creating physical solutions and offering them to assuage neighbor concerns is important too. And right now we're not seeing enough of those. Um, the fifth of the five urban design objectives for the non-historic area is to discourage adverse impacts from noise, night lighting, poor building design, and commercial service areas on adjacent residential neighborhoods. I think for the 1603 building to meet this objective, it needs to, um, to have some sensitive redesign in a few areas. But, um, but otherwise, uh, I think the intensity and, and the, the goals of this project are terrific. And, and I think the design's got you on a, on a good, good road. So are there any other planning board members that want to add or make another comment, pile on, disagree? Or has everybody said their piece? Looks like Sarah's got her hand up and John put his hand up too. Sarah? Well, I, just, I just wanna agree with every single solitary thing Harmon just said. Okay. John? Yeah, Harmon, you said it well. No need for any addition from me. Okay, Peter's got his thumb up. Any other thoughts? I know that uh, planning board chairs in the past have taken it as their obligation to summarize the comments of the board at concept review. And as a board member, I always question um, that practice. And as a chair, I don't engage in it because I, I think that um, the applicants had a chance to hear everything that we've said. They've placed appropriate weight on the things that we've said. They've taken notes. I've seen applicants bending over and writing. So um, I, I'm not going to try to restate what you all said. So this is your last chance before we turn it back to the applicant for any responses or comments. Lisa? Um, I'll just speak to, to uh, something that I asked about early on and um very briefly pontificate on why I said it. Uh, just with anything that shows up in front of us, um, with the wildfires we're experiencing now with the 2013 floods, the earlier we can hear about um, what you're doing even above and beyond what code for calls for or what loans require um, regarding sustainability and specifically addressing climate change. Speaking for myself individually, the happier I'll be when I see that incorporated. Um, so it's probably something not just for current applicants and for this uh, this project, but for anyone else who's watching or listening. And I know a lot of you have a multitude of projects. Um, I hope to see that brought forward early in the process uh, and emphasized. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. All right, going once for board comments, final board comments, thoughts. Okay. Um, let's give the applicant a minute or two to uh, respond back to us or give us any feedback on our feedback to them if they choose. Go for it. Uh, Chairman Zuckerman, thank you for the chance to present tonight and thank you for your kind attention and thoughtful comments. I mean, it's really great for us. This has been a project that has been um, a part of our work for a long time. So it's really exciting to actually get it out here into the public uh, forum and, and hear your comments and hear your support for much of it. We too are, you know, we're wrestling with those issues that have been addressed, particularly with our neighbors to the east on the annex property. And we thought we had done some of that. Obviously we have more work to do and we're happy to undertake that and look at it. Uh, there are some, you know, financial constraints that you work with in affordable housing and trying to get that to all pay out and work out. And so you can actually afford to build affordable housing. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's some of the constraints we live within and we'll, we'll take that on. Uh, as to the main main campus, uh, great uh, feedback on that. We'll work on that. You know, this is an emerging change. We had to do some considerable changes on the site plan to meet the downtown urban design criteria. And we probably just kind of rushed that a bit. So we'll take that back. And you've given us some great insight on our, our concerns there. Um, so we'll definitely undertake that. We haven't uh, articulated our sustainability goals. The, the church is committed to that, and, and certainly these buildings will be. Uh, there's no greater statement, Lisa, to be sustainable than to be there for 147 years through multiple generations where we continue to serve the city of Boulder, and that's really what we're about. So we're going to be there with you in, in some form or another, and as one speaker said, maybe for another 300 years. 
So I think we're grateful for the chance tonight. We really appreciate the insight. The work of staff was extraordinary. 133 page memo is just unbelievable. And uh, we are grateful for the work that's gone on. So we're gonna be with you for a while. We'll be back and forth for many more hearings. You'll hear more from us. We'll have a chance to interact in this way some more. So thank you for this evening. Thank you for your time, your commitment to the city of Boulder and your attention to our project. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We really appreciate your time too. All right, with that, I'm gonna uh, end the public hearing and we, uh, we can excuse um, the applicant and anyone uh, who doesn't want to be part of the rest of tonight's hearing, which is just some matters. Um, we have uh, matters from the planning board, planning director and city attorney, a little debrief and calendar check and then we'll adjourn. So hopefully we'll get you all out of here before nine o'clock. Wow, nice. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so nice, nice uh, job, everyone. Um, do we have any uh, planning board matters from board members that we need to talk about? Sarah? I don't think we, I don't know if we need to talk about it, but I would love to get an update on Alpine Balsam at some point, see where that conversation is within planning department. I'm happy to. Great, thank you. Thanks for that. Anybody else have any uh, planning board matters? John? Yeah, and uh, similar to Sarah's, I'd like to get an update on the Fruhauf, uh property development and activity there. Great. Any other uh, committees or um, other boards, liaison reports, anything anybody wants to bring to the board? Okay. John, I didn't miss a, a See You South thing, did I? Did we have anything in the- No, oh, that's coming up uh, tomorrow, in fact, at uh, I think 11 o'clock. 11. Oh, 11. I'm so glad I asked. That's the process meeting though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but we don't have another subcommittee meeting, the one that went off and- Well, you know, I- I have to confess, I'm not quite sure how much I process and how much substance there'll be. Okay. Yeah. Lupita. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about what's the status on the meetings for the uh, East Boulder uh, subcommittee? Oh, uh, well, I, I've been uh, participating in those. There's uh, one coming up next week on Friday at I think it's at 2.30. Friday at 2.30? Do you mind, who would I need to ask if I wanted to attend that one? Yeah, I, you should. <laughs> okay, are there any other planning board members that would require that meeting to be noticed? Besides you, John? I don't think anyone else is planning to show up except Lupita maybe. Okay. Lupita, I think you can contact Kathleen King on that. And you know, Lupita, I can forward you the uh, the appointment. I have it right here. Okay. okay, thank you. Sarah. But we have to start working on our letter to city council. We're going to talk about that. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that's our, our only item tonight under matters. Uh, any other specific items for planning board members? Um, yeah, John. I can I can embroider a little bit on on the CU South if anyone's interested. I attended the RAB meeting uh, that was uh, this last Monday, and there uh, the topic of CU South came up with some issues of substance that uh, that staff indicated that they would be answering on this Friday. So. Uh, David, uh, you might be interested to be aware of that. Good, yeah, because I, I I felt like we had made a huge progress in the last subcommittee meeting, but I just I thought we were maybe going to get together one more time, and then I it just kind of went off my radar. So well, maybe this will kind of bring it closed. Who knows? Yeah, there were there were two questions that staff was going to get back on, and and okay. they haven't yet, but they might do it on Friday. Excellent, thank you. I'm so glad I asked. All right, so 
staff. Uh, do we have any matters from the planning director? Um, just a couple of quick updates. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that council did unanimously call up the Macy's site review on Tuesday night. So we will be working toward a public hearing probably in December on that. Um, so stay tuned there. And um, Kathleen King was in front of planning board a few weeks ago, gave everybody an update and asked you guys a couple of questions about the East Boulder subcommunity plan moving forward. You guys provided some really helpful feedback. We had a conversation with council on Tuesday night that was very successful. Um, I think they appreciated the board's feedback and um, the, uh, we'll be happily moving on into the new year with the next phases. So um, it was a really great discussion and we appreciate the, the feedback. So um, I think those are the only two updates that I had for the board. Oh, uh, and Jacob Lindsay, our new uh, director of planning and development services um, we'll start with the city on November 16th. I think he's really looking forward to getting to know everybody. So there'll be individual appointments set up with folks um, toward the end of the year so that we can get to know Jacob a little bit better. Um, and I think that just leaves the annual letter to council, Cindy. Yeah. Um, so um, council put together some questions and directed me to send it to the chair, which I did on, um, I don't know, about the 20th of October. So, no, is that when I did it? No, it was, uh, I'm sorry, it was earlier than that. It was about the 5th of October. I sent it out to Harmon and, um, and other chairs of boards that I do. And um, it had three questions in it. And um, I can let Harmon elaborate on those. And um, so, and they would like to have those, um, have the letters prepared uh, and submitted no later than December 18th. So it gives us several meetings to for you guys to discuss and, and put it together. They'd like to limit the letters to approximately two pages. Um, and um, then they would like someone from the board to present, um, give a three minute, and Charles, you can help me with this because you Mm -hmm. told me about this just the other day, a, a three minute summary of the letter to council on um, January 12th, was that right? That's correct. So the council will be having their um, pre-retreat study session on January 12th. So they'd like a member of the board to um, just give a summary, kind of max three to five minutes of um, the board's positions. All right. So the, the letter is different from the letters that we've had in the past. And it, it, it says basically what, what made you happy about this year on planning board? What made you sad? And- uh, Literally, that's what, what it says. <laughs> what, what, what's next? So I don't feel that um, excited about answering those questions. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with those terms, happy and sad, because um, that's not what I do here. <laughs> never, I not my let me know what COVID. Do the things about being sad. Right, so, so I, I think we ought to rethink that. And I propose that we each just kind of go back and think about um, what, what, um, what event occurred this year um, as that came in front of us on planning board that we thought was the most encouraging um, model for how Boulder should develop um, or change? Um, what, what's the least encouraging? And, uh, and what would we like to see uh, as something new in the future? And then, Take as much time as you want to uh, to think about those things, and then bring them to another matters, and we'll advocate for our positions, and uh, hopefully come to some sort of a agreement about what we can include in the letter from everyone to the board. Does that sound like, or to the council? Does that sound something like a reasonable approach? It's still three questions, just phrased. <laughs> Other questions. I actually. Uh, was hoping that we will revisit the letter that we submitted last year, and then we can see 
where recommendations went. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe that could be something that made you sad. <laughs> My recommendation went nowhere. <laughs> I'll just echo that. Um, I'm sad because of you. <laughs> I think every year that we do the letter, I think it makes uh, it's very helpful to go back and see what we wrote in previous years. I'll be happy to send out last year's letter to you all again, um, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah that would be yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, okay. we might be able to determine what was able to move really truly forward. We can see progress and, and then maybe some other ones. Um, I mean, this year, you know, it's such a special year that we might have a completely different new set of priorities. Who knows? Yeah. Um, anyways, I just thought to go we'll see what happened with what we said last time. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personally just mortified on a daily basis for our lack of response to the climate crisis. And the, uh, the fires have, have exploded. You know, people don't really get the size of these things. And I want to give you a little little sense of it. I, I came back from the Terrials on a dirt road uh, as far as service 211 uh, a couple of years ago. Um, one of the longest, uh, best marked dirt roads in the state. And there's about, I don't know, 20, 25 mile stretch of it. It's not a challenging road, but you don't need four wheel drive or anything, but it's it helps to have a rugged vehicle, but for 20, 25 miles for an hour, I was in the Hayman fire, you know, for an hour, just driving and driving and driving at 20, 25 miles an hour without, you know, seeing beautiful country. It's mostly seeing burnt sticks and ruined landscape and, you know, in incredibly, uh, you know, damaged soil that blows around when the wind blows. And we've got two fires this summer that are bigger than that. 300 square miles is the biggest fire. And the Troublesome grew from 20,000 acres, which is like 30, 32 square miles, to 120,000 acres, which is close to 200 square miles. Last night. Yeah, almost overnight. Yeah. yeah. So now we're going to have three fires in one summer that are all bigger than the one that it took me an hour to drive through. And the state's going to look terrible there. I mean, it's really, it's not going to be pretty. And I heard a water manager for a Northern Colorado town talking about how 50% of the watershed that provides water to his city is burned in the last three summers. What does that do to your, your water quality, to what you have to do at your intakes, to the amount of water you get, to the trout fisheries in those streams? I mean, it's just, it's horrific. So anyway, I, you know, that's my soapbox, but for me, it's a lot about climate right now. Right. And I just wanted to kind of contextualize how large these numbers are because you hear them all the time, but I'm not sure everybody really understands how big they are. I, I hear you, uh, Harmon. Uh, you know, I, it's interesting because you know, I've been talking about this coming for decades with my own family, and and, uh, and my family is in California for the most part, and and they've been dealing with this for a while. And you know, I used to lecture my family why I drive very small car, why I didn't have this, and I didn't want that, the choice of a career that I that I made. And finally coming around to understand all of it. Um, you know, we talked about climate change not being just about things getting warm. It's about the radical changes. And, you know, we're gonna get snow just in a couple of days, another 40 or maybe 50 degree change in, in, in temperature, uh, which are very, very bad, you know, up and down, you know, plants, not only humans, but, you know, we're talking about the, all ecosystems. But anyways, I was going to say, because I'm with you on that, and I have young children that I think about all the time about what we're handing to them. Mm -hmm. And yet, the single most important thing that we need to do right now is to make sure we vote. Mm -hmm. Because climate change will continue to be a challenge. Nothing's going to happen until we 
personally make that change. Yes, David, I saw it. I love you because I just turned mine in, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, and 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 really is. Uh, there's just so many. I don't know. There are many sort of challenges, but I think that is the first one is to start changing leadership. And in our own town, taking leadership to change other things that make things like a Trump administration possible, which is the deep racism that we have in this country. So all of these things are connected. So we get climate change because we have bad leaders and we have bad leaders because we allow racism to run amok in this country. It's all one problem. So let's all work on all of them so we can hand something better to our children. Lisa. Um, I was just gonna say off of that, literally the reason I went back to grad school and got the degrees I did was climate change. Um, and I thought about being a virologist for a while and working in emerging diseases and going into public health. Um, and it's, and I thought about disaster management and, you know, going into that and it's all intertwined, you know, we're, we are going like pandemics will keep happening because of climate change, because of the forests that we're cutting down because of increasing interaction of humans with animals. And we're kind of barely hanging on right now. I think, you know, we, we have all these like disasters happening simultaneously and many of us are, you know, I don't know. I, I saw a friend who's a high school teacher and this is somebody who's so sunny and like her, the first words out of her mouth were, I'm not okay. Um, you know, and, and I think that's all of us right now. Um, and so not to make it too much of a downer, but I, I really appreciate what you said, Hyman, and what you said, Lupita, and it just is so entwined. You know, when people feel threatened, we get more tribal, we close off, we get more misogynistic, we get more racist. Um, and so I, I think we're all kind of being called to higher and better action right now. Um, and, you know, when we look at planning, in the built form and, and the things that we look at from that 10,000 or 30,000 foot level, um, it impacts a bunch of other things too. So, so I, I hope that in our letter and also in our daily lives and how we show up that we just keep that friend and center because um, we're either at or past the tipping point um, and what we do every day really matters right now, so. So, you know, what, what encourages you the most? Um, what, uh, what has discouraged you, like, or, you know, think about it in terms of what are our greatest opportunities and what are our most tricky challenges um, as, as a board? Um, and then how would we like to, to um, what change would we like most to see moving towards the future? And I think if, if we just each think about answers to those questions, um, and then throw them out there together, we can pick the ones that are the most important to us and uh, hopefully keep it under two pages to the city council. I'll just keep putting this on the agenda under matters. So we can- Maybe we should just, I don't know what our, what's on the agenda for next our next meeting, whether it's a super long meeting or not, but if it's not, maybe we could just plan for next meeting to be a first conversation and see what we can draft up. We have two public hearings and one matter. Um, yeah, pulling it up. Meeting, I think, but the meeting of the 19th uh, would probably be another opportunity. Okay, that would be a good one. Yeah, actually we don't have, the meeting of the 19th, we have no public hearings, we just have an, a matter. Mm -hmm. That's, is, What's the likelihood, Charles, that we'll end up with a public hearing? Um, well, we're starting to get pretty close to the deadlines. I would say pretty slim at this point. Okay. That would be great because in the past we've held special meetings to write the letter and we may not have to do that if the 19th is open like that. Yeah. I have someone who hasn't done one of these before. Do you guys typically like write up some sentences or like bullet points for yourself about kind of what you're hoping will make it in. And then we workshop it live together or like what's the, okay. Exactly. And, and you know, we, uh, it's easier in a room. You know, we've, we've had years where we've been in a room full of whiteboards and somebody, you know, has volunteered to grab a dry erase marker and try to, get, you know, get things down. This might be a little bit more difficult, but. Um, well, I, I suggest 
and and I don't know what resources are available to us, Cindy, and you know what makes open meeting rules and all of that. Um, or maybe we can just daylight it as we go. But but you know, if we could do something where we could take like our ideas and what we want to drop in and not edit each other's stuff, but put it all in the equivalent of a shared Google Doc or something in Microsoft, um, you know, so that we could see everything together. And that might be really nice. And then I don't know if it's possible, you know, maybe if um, someone who's running the meeting or one of us could share a screen and just kind of be editing it in live time like we do with language when we're making motions so we can actually see it happening. Um, I think that would help me a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. We could definitely do put a, I could start a Google Doc and then just share it with all of you guys. And then um, you could add to it your pieces. And then um, I could edit, you know, share my screen and then edit it on the fly as, as you as you guys are having your discussion. Great. So is there, here's is my there, suggestion. We'll, what we'll do, go ahead, David, I'll, I'll say it in a sec. Oh yeah, I was just gonna ask, is there a subtext at all about us um, using this uh, format to do the traditional helping of priorities that go into the work plan for the next year, given a tough year and uh, you know reduce funding and everything. And in the past, these letters have really been used to try to get some guidance as, as the work plan gets formalized, but this is not a structure that necessarily calls that out in the same way. Yeah, Dave, that's a good point. And I think um, we could probably do the happy, sad, um, you know, what, what could we do differently? <laughs> next year, but I don't think that there's anything that would preclude you guys from adding a section that um, would help to daylight to counsel what you feel like work program priorities should be for the, the coming year. I'd be happy to, you know, if we if we had what should we do differently as kind of a big macro idea, um, you know, walk the walk and, and talk the talk and create, you know, the city, the walkable city of, of the future, but then also add in, um, you know, some here are some concrete steps that planning board still considers to be uh, important and would like to see in council's work plan for the upcoming year. Um, that just falls into the third question. So my right. suggestion is is that I would I would provide for the board um, the phraseology for the three questions. Give it to Cindy and she'll distribute those, and then everybody do their own. Uh, answers to those three questions a uh, few days at least before the November 19th meeting. Then we can collate everybody's, uh, everybody's responses and give us something to work off of. Does that sound good? Great. Okay. All right, so we're done with that. Anything from Hella from the city attorney's office? Nothing. Any, no matters? Nothing's the matter, okay. Uh, <laughs> Meeting debrief, calendar check. Anybody have anything more to add about the meeting? Okay. Calendar check. You ran a nice meeting. Thanks, John. Um, Sarah, uh, did you have anything? No, um, I, I know that we have been told that all our meetings till the end of the year are online. Um, that was like a month ago. So do we know about January at this point? Yeah. So council had a discussion about that last week as well. And I think it's safe to assume that we're gonna be remote for the foreseeable future. Okay, all right. Are you guys liking getting your packets on the Monday rather than Fridays? Fine. You okay with that? Yep. All good. I did find this one surprisingly hard to read. I don't know about anyone else, but I the drawings were really hard to kind of Oh, um, okay. Laptop. I mean, it's not your, it's not anything we can do about it, but for some reason, this particular, the drawings were hard to read. I missed the getting the hard copies. The floor, the floor plans for the concept review were actually blurry enough that I, yeah, um, it, it, um, I, I totally concur. I, I, I think it was the fault of the floor plans that were submitted, but yeah, it took me forever to figure out that floors two and three were exactly the same and <laughs> 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 what's going on here. So, yeah. I was like, am I just not zooming in enough for like, what am I doing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll check the resolution next time. Yeah. yeah. And Cindy, we should probably think about that when we transmit this call up to council too. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. We have your drawings. Yeah. And I, I've seen Coburn use this, um, this style of, of different colors for different activity zones within a project before. 
And it's been effective in, in some other projects in front of us, but it just didn't work on the church site because I think it worked on the 1603 for me, but on the church site, it was so hard to understand what was staying, what was going, what was going on. All these irregularly shaped buildings overlapping and stuff like that. It was just like, what is the difference between blue and pink? I can't, <laughs> I had trouble with it too. Okay. I feel way better. I was like, why can't I understand? <laughs> I don't think it was the staff's problem. I think it was actually just, this was a, a kind of a weird uh, layout and configuration to try to understand. And it wasn't a terribly, I, in my judgment, it wasn't a terribly effective way that the applicant presented it. So. But the, I, have, I think everybody I, thought the lanes analysis was just amazing. So that kind of countered the bad, the blurry pictures. <laughs> oh no, Elaine did an awesome I have to job. be honest, whenever I get part of, um, whenever I get plans from them, I'm always like, oh, <laughs> it takes me forever to resize them and stuff like that. So it's always a, they're yeah, a beast. Let's give, let's give that some thoughts, Cindy. Yeah, for sure. I just sent a note, so. I agree. Elaine definitely knocked it out of the park. Really good job. Yeah, it was a very solid memo. Very. Thanks thank her. Thank her from. Thank her very much. Will do. Calendar check. Um, we're just kind of barreling towards the end of the year. So um, we have meetings scheduled for November 5th and then again on the 19th. And then we get into the Thanksgiving holiday break. Um, we have a meeting scheduled for December 3rd, and right now we don't have any items for December 17th. Um, typically, it's nice if we don't have two meetings in December, just because a lot of people start thinking about traveling and stuff for the holidays. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case this year, but it still might be nice to have a little bit of a break. So if we can avoid um, piling up any items on the 17th, we, we certainly will. Any individual planning board members with calendar issues? Lupita? I just can't believe the year is almost over. Yeah. <laughs> it I'd cannot, like come, cannot come soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> this year has five sucked. <laughs> five years to get through 2020 so far. Yeah, how about it? Did you guys see that they found these like in Egypt, they found the, like 25 sarcophaguses and, um, and this hidden chamber of everything. And I'm just like, for God's sakes, don't open them. <laughs> just walk away. God, don't. <laughs> this is not the year to open them. <laughs> I see they moved. Uh... Aspen Gay Ski Week a week later, so it would conflict with the 21st if we have a meeting. But if we're still doing it remotely, I'll just do it from there. So, yeah, we'll definitely be doing it remotely. Yeah, I assume we will. Okay, Lupita. So, yeah, I'm. I wondering if got if you guys became aware of um, the resolution that City Council brought up on Tuesday, and Charles was there. Um, I can't remember because I, I had it open and then I had to reboot my computer, so now it's gone. Uh, but it was a uh, a, a really thoughtful uh, resolution uh, that Councilwoman uh, Young brought about um, declaring, uh, I think, how, did, how was it declaring racism? Racism a as a public health crisis. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then similarly, um, Council also heard a resolution or an update on renaming the municipal building after Penfield Tate the second, who was um, Boulder's first black mayor, was a bit activist, just you know, amazing individual. So that was met with um, a lot of enthusiasm as well. Right. So those almost, have some good yeah, things he happening. He almost lost his position through a recall uh, for standing up for human rights. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Yeah. I did. Was there any? Um, did they? What did they decide to do with the Duchambe Tea House? Uh, that yeah, it was such an action-packed city council on Tuesday night. Um, yeah. So, um, again, really favorable on the uh, recommendation for landmarking, but they did direct staff to go back and draft some conditions that would landmark the interior of the building. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure that rises to my level of. A, a problem 
<laughs> that needs a solution right at the moment, but I guess, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Landmarks was really sad that they didn't have a way to protect the interior as well. I yeah, I guess it's a good thing to work on. I, I, just, I, I think in this case, it's a little bit different because the city owns the building and we actually manage the asset, so. So that's um, why I was thinking it really didn't need to be addressed urgently during the COVID crisis, but oh well, <laughs> I guess we'll address it. <laughs> Interesting. So are, are, are we done? Um, anybody have anything else? Nothing from staff. Okay, then thank you all very much for uh, your time and attention tonight. Have a great night, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Good night. Stay warm tonight. Yes. Guys, don't let any fires in your backyard to stay warm, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night.